2019 looked to be an exciting year for me. I had recently joined a secret government unit called the Ancestral Protectors, a team of Native Americans who hunt and eliminate dangerous creatures from folklore. My name is Nathan Two Bears, and I never knew that the world contained such horrors until I started working here. It all began during our mission in northern Maine. We received information about suspicious activities near remote hiking trails. Our briefings never mentioned anything specific, but locals reported unnatural animal attacks and several mutilated bodies discovered in the area. The authorities were baffled and reached out to my unit for assistance since our expertise revolved around such inexplicable occurrences. When we arrived in Maine on a chilly November morning, I was partnered with a seasoned member of the team, Willow McGregor. She had Aztec tattoos winding down both her arms and was known for her skill with firearms and stealth tactics. As we drove towards the site of the recent attacks, Willow cracked a couple of jokes that broke some of the tension and helped me feel at ease with her despite the daunting assignment ahead. As we approached the trailhead into deep woods, nervous tension crept back into our systems. Grabbing our backpacks filled with essential tools and weapons necessary for our mission, we dove right into investigating the first potential crime scene. The scene painted an eerie picture as crimson stains were splattered against rocks while shattered tree limbs dangled several feet above us. They looked like they had been twisted apart by something powerful, something monstrous. While we couldn't find any recognizable tracks or distinguishable features identifying what creature was responsible, Willow felt certain it wasn't a bear or any other standard predator native to these parts. As we continued to scout along the trail, I noticed the air growing colder, not just because of natural climate changes you'd expect as day turned into evening, but it felt unnatural too. Suddenly, Willow darted behind a bush, signaled for me to hunker down. My heart raced as we peered out from our hiding spot. Down the path, we saw a figure dragging an unconscious hiker through the underbrush. The creature was no ordinary beast. It had the body of a bear yet stripped to raw muscle and sinew without fur. Its elongated snout led to razor-sharp teeth that glistened in the dim light and its eyes burrowed into your soul like searing coals. I gripped my knife tightly and glanced at Willow, who was loading her gun. We shared a knowing glance and prepared to spring into action once the creature came within range. Before we could move, however, something remarkable happened. It began transforming right before our eyes. In an instant, the beastly figure shifted entirely, and took on the shape of a tall man with unclothed skin so white it could blind you. I had heard stories of legends involving shapeshifters but never thought I would encounter one up close. The gunfire caused echoes that shook the forest as Willow unleashed her weapon relentlessly on the shapeshifter before us. It stumbled and howled in pain but did not die or bleed like you'd expect each bullet wound seemed to heal nearly as quickly as it was inflicted. As our ammunition dwindled and our position grew more precarious each second, I made an executive decision. It was time for us to retreat and regroup with our team for better tactics and weaponry against this formidable foe who hadn't yet revealed its full potential. We managed to evade it temporarily as we dashed through dense forestation, hoping to buy ourselves enough time to strategize. In a moment of halted pursuit, Willow spoke hurriedly into her walkie-talkie to update our colleagues about the situation, while I kept watch for any signs of impending danger. The sun was quickly sinking below the horizon thrusting a cloak of darkness over the woods as a sinister sense of doom encroached on us. The time for action had to be now or never. We readied ourselves, preparing to strike back against the heinous creature that had so far proven itself immune to anything we threw at it. 
With no time to waste, Willow and I made our way to a nearby cave, hoping it would serve as temporary shelter and give us a chance to regroup with our team. The cave was eerily quiet, but it provided just enough cover from the pursuing creature. We tried to catch our breath while discussing our next move through hushed whispers. As we spoke, I noticed strange markings on the cave walls. One of them seemed to depict a humanoid figure with elongated limbs and claws, much like the creature we were facing. Although I'm no expert in folklore or mythology, it struck me as odd to see such a resemblance here. We soon heard rustling sounds outside. Willow quickly contacted our team on her walkie-talkie, urgently requesting backup and informing them of our location. She didn't know if they'd make it in time, but we had no choice but to hope for the best. As the night wore on, the creature showed up at the mouth of the cave, its grotesque figure illuminated by the faint moonlight. Its skin was almost translucent as if it had been bleached by some unimaginable force. It stalked towards us with frightening speed, baring its teeth and growling menacingly. Willow picked up a large rock and used it to threaten the creature while I tossed flares at its feet. Though it flinched from the bright light momentarily, it continued its relentless pursuit. Just then, we saw flashlights approaching in the distance. Our team had arrived. They opened fire on the monster-looking thing that refused to die. As bullets pierced its flesh, I observed that not only did its wounds heal rapidly, but that they also seemed to empower it somehow. The creature's rage grew more intense with each gunshot until one of our colleagues was within reach of its deadly claws. It lunged at him and tore him apart with horrifying efficiency a scene so gruesome it will haunt me for the rest of my days. There was no time to mourn. We needed to survive and understand what we were up against. Our team's leader, Jackson, took charge while we continued to fend off the seemingly indestructible creature. After realizing that conventional weapons were useless, he ordered us to retreat to a safe distance as he put in a call for emergency backup, hoping that whoever they were would have a better chance at containing this monstrous being. We retreated further into the woods, carrying our wounded and leaving behind the remains of our fallen comrade. The creature continued to chase us, but its focus momentarily shifted to feeding on our colleague's corpse, providing us with an opportunity for escape. It was then that I overheard one of the senior members conversing with Jackson about the possibility of it being a rare cryptid native to these woods. The emergency backup arrived in record time. To our surprise, they were armed with specialized weapons and gadgets designed specifically for handling cases like this, creatures that defied all logical explanation and had unknown origin or intentions. Engaging in a final confrontation, the team managed to trap the creature using high-frequency sonic devices that incapacitated it temporarily. A black, armored vehicle pulled up beside it and expertly loaded the subdued beast into its confines, ready for transportation to an unknown location. Exhausted by the night's events, we finally had time to fully process what had just happened. Jackson revealed that the monster was believed to be a legendary cryptid called the Pale Man. Sightings had been reported sporadically throughout history, but actual encounters were rare and often doubted due to their otherworldly nature. We paid our respects to our fallen team member, knowing that his sacrifice led us one step closer to understanding these elusive creatures. As we prepared to leave, I couldn't help but wonder if there were more such beings lurking in the shadows, and if we would ever cross paths again. The year was 1997, and the world seemed a lot simpler back then. My name is Mason Deerfoot, and I was part of the Red Shadows, 
an elite task force composed of Native American operatives from different tribes across the United States. Our primary objective was to hunt down and eliminate any malicious folklore creatures that posed a threat to our people or others. I found myself stationed in a secluded area outside the quiet town of Bisbee, Arizona. The area was filled with natural beauty, surrounded by majestic mountains and untamed wilderness. My fellow operatives, Michael Two Bears and Emily Featherwind, were nearby working on gathering more intelligence about our latest target. We set up our base camp just out of town along a creek that ran through the bottom of a rocky canyon. Our latest mission involved an unknown creature that had been brutally murdering individuals within the community according to local reports. Two bodies had been discovered in the last month, lying mutilated and unrecognizable near their homes. The distinctive nature of these attacks prompted our superiors to send us on this mission. It was around dusk when Michael located something while checking one of the crime scenes. He motioned for us to come over to him urgently. I found this trail leading away from the house. The ground is disturbed here it might have been dragging something with it. Michael said seriously as he pointed to an uneven dirt path leading towards some trees. Emily stepped closer, examining the tracks on the ground. You're right about that. Look at those markings and what's that peculiar smell? As we ventured further along the trail, it led deeper into a dense thicket of trees. It didn't take long before we stumbled upon bits and pieces of shredded clothing and what appeared to be dried blood splattered on the leaves around us. Suddenly, a faint, eerie whistle cut through the air from somewhere nearby. It sent chills up my spine as I realized it was no ordinary sound. It seemed deliberate, like a taunt. What the hell was that? Emily whispered, gripping her gun. I don't know, replied Michael, his eyes scanning the darkening woods. But I don't like it. As we continued our search, the whistle sounded again louder this time. Emily whirled around catching sight of a tall, hunched figure standing several yards away from us. Guys, look at that! The figure was covered with matted fur, its elongated limbs bent at unnatural angles. In its left hand, it held a long, jagged blade stained with dried blood. As it bared its teeth in a twisted grin, its eyes gleamed with malicious intent. We stood silently, Paralyzed by fear, as the creature slowly approached us, its twisted grin never faltered. I wanted to call for help, but my phone had no signal, rendering it useless. Grab anything you can use as a weapon, Emily whispered. Michael and I quickly scanned our surroundings and picked up large branches lying on the forest floor. As it neared us, the creature suddenly lunged toward Michael. He barely had time to react. The monstrous blade sliced through Michael's abdomen, leaving him gasping in pain. The creature's laughter echoed through the trees as it turned to face Emily and me. Emily aimed her gun at the creature and pulled the trigger without hesitation. The bullet struck its shoulder, eliciting a guttural scream from the beast. But instead of retreating, it only seemed to get angrier. The creature lunged towards Emily this time, who managed to dodge out of its way before landing a hit on its skull with her gun. Seizing this opportunity to escape, we helped Michael up and started running back down the trail towards civilization. With each step we took, we could sense the creature following not far behind us. It attacked relentlessly as we fled in terror for our lives occasionally stopping just long enough for Emily to fire off a few rounds while I struggled to carry Michael's limp body over my shoulder. As we stumbled upon an old cabin deep within the woods, a plan formed in my head. We desperately needed a place to hide and tend to Michael's wounds. So how about setting a trap for this relentless monster? Emily signaled her agreement silently. 
she saw no other choice either. After securing Michael inside the cabin on an old dusty mattress, Emily barricaded the doors, and I gathered flammable materials from around the cabin. Setting up a small makeshift bonfire outside, we waited in tense silence for our pursuer's arrival. The haunting whistle we heard earlier rang out in the distance, growing louder by the second. As the creature stepped into view, we ignited the bonfire and watched as its sinister grin turned into wide-eyed horror. The flames spread rapidly towards the creature. Emily fired a few more rounds, hitting its legs and causing it to stumble into the blaze. As it screamed in agony, we couldn't help but feel both relief and repulsion. The grotesque sight of the creature writhing in pain was indeed gruesome and disturbing. Leaving the burning beast behind, we tended to Michael's wounds in the cabin until help arrived early the next day after Emily managed to get a weak signal on her phone. Michael was alive but barely conscious. Once local authorities got involved, an expert on local folklore identified the creature as El Chupacabra, a cryptid known for terrorizing livestock and feasting on blood. The cabin belonged to a hermit who dedicated his life to studying El Chupacabra's habits and eventually fell victim to its presence. Though Michael survived thanks to emergency surgery at a nearby hospital, he faced months of recovery from his injuries. We all sought therapy to understand and accept what had happened in those horrifying events, not for our individual feelings but for respecting what each other had gone through. El Chupacabra's remains were recovered from the ashes of our fiery trap, effectively proving the reality of this vicious creature's existence. In time, Emily and I found solace in relaying this harrowing experience with each other, forever united by memories of a gruesome conflict that would forever haunt us like chilling reminders of an unsettled past. June 2019 was not so different from any other month in my life as a fire lookout it was just another day on the job in the remote Sierra Nevada mountains. My name is Everett, and the fire watch tower has been my home for more than a year now. The one thing that has kept me going strong here is the silence and solitude. But there's nothing quite like the moment you realize you are not alone out here in the vast wilderness. It all began on an especially slow day. I'd spotted only a few small smoke plumes, but they never grew into anything more serious. If I'm being honest with myself, I was growing restless during those long, dull hours in the tower. So when I caught sight of a weird-looking animal near Jarding Peak off in the distance, my curiosity peaked. The creature was unlike anything I had ever seen before. It had mottled fur with a peculiar coloration, as if all the colors of autumn were blended together in its coat. Its limbs were long and twisted, and its movements odd and unnatural. I decided to radio the base and mention my discovery. Doris responded with her usual sense of humor. Everett, sounds like someone's too bored up there. It's probably just a big coyote or something. I smiled at her witty remark but couldn't shake off my gut feeling that something was off about the creature. Over time, I noticed its peculiar behavior patterns became more aggressive and erratic. I would frequently see it at various distances from my tower, always watching me intently with its strange eyes that held an unnerving intelligence behind them. Late one afternoon, while scavenging for firewood near my tower, I heard an unfamiliar sound echoing through the woods beneath my watchful eyes, soft laughter. I called out towards the source but received no response. Uneasily returning to my tower, it all seemed to be business as usual until dusk settled. As the sun dipped below the horizon, the laughter intensified. 
The eerie sounds were getting closer each time, and I felt my heartbeat race with uncertainty. Hastening my pace, I clambered up the tower ladder frantically to escape whatever was coming near me. Slamming shut and locking the hatch, I realized that in my panic I had dropped my walkie-talkie outside. It was no use. Doris wouldn't be able to send help now. It wasn't long before I noticed something moving within the tree line at the edge of my vision. There it was again, the creature I had been observing for so long, yet now it appeared even more monstrous than I initially perceived. The creature wasted no time as it skulked towards me with malicious intent. Its enormous claws scraped along the forest floor as it moved with incredible speed. Ripping apart trees and vegetation, nothing seemed capable of stopping this monster in its tracks. My breath caught in my throat as the creature began climbing up the tower with frightening ease. It made no noise aside from its ragged breathing and the occasional clangs of its claws against metal. Suddenly, everything grew quiet just like an orchestra pausing right before a crescendo. My worst fears were confirmed when I heard rustling on the lookout windows. The creature's twisty hands oozed a smelly sap-like substance while it attempted to break through the fortified glass. Thankfully, these windows were made to withstand forest fires. Anything less would have crumbled under this relentless assault. The ghastly creature howled in frustration forcing hot blood to my ears which pounded with each of its violent strikes on the window pane. Hours seemed to pass without reprieve from its tireless attacks on my sanctuary. The continuous pounding and scratching continued, creating an overwhelming cacophony that pushed me to the breaking point. Desperate to protect myself, I scanned the lookout for any means of defense or escape. Suddenly, an idea struck me. I had brought a flare gun with me as part of my standard equipment while on duty. It was tucked away in a small cabinet near my cot. I retrieved it quickly and with trembling hands loaded a flare cartridge. Below my tower, the creature unleashed an enraged roar as it continued its assault. The windows rattled holding strong against the monster's ferocity for now. Glancing out, I spotted Doris arriving nearby in a park ranger vehicle along with other colleagues from the emergency response team. The flare's bright red light shot into the air and exploded, capturing their attention instantly. Doris grabbed the walkie-talkie from the dashboard and radioed for backup. Meanwhile, inside the tower... I could tell the creature was becoming more aggressive and impatient in its relentless efforts to breach my sanctuary. My fear turned into calculated determination as I decided to use my last flare cartridge to defend myself. As the creature came within inches of breaking through a weakened windowpane, I aimed the flare gun downward and fired directly at it. The flare struck its distorted face with a blinding explosion of light, causing it to screech violently and relinquish its grip on the tower. Taking advantage of this temporary reprieve, I peered outside and saw that Doris had secured a high-powered tranquilizer rifle. She aimed carefully and carefully fired several darts into the disoriented creature. Its movements began to slow dramatically until it eventually slumped to the ground, unconscious but alive. The rest of my colleagues rushed forward, restraining it with heavy-duty chains and nets while some tended to any injuries it sustained during the struggle. Several hours passed before we were all safely evacuating the area with the subdued creature in tow. An expert team of biologists and zoologists wasted no time in examining this newfound cryptid, hoping to learn more about its origins and motivations. Upon debriefing with my superiors, I recounted every detail of the harrowing experience. From that day on, my life never returned to normalcy.
I opted for early retirement from my old ranger job, forever grateful to Doris and the emergency response team who had come to my aid. The captured creature remained under constant observation, providing valuable information for scientific research. In time, it was relocated to a secure wildlife preserve with strict measures in place to monitor its well-being and prevent any future incidents. To this day, I can't help but think about those who had encountered the creature before me and were less fortunate. I'll never forget their sacrifices or the unnerving laughter that still haunts my dreams. I want to tell you something that happened to me, something I still can't quite wrap my head around. My name is Jasper Zelinsky, and at the time... I was working late in my office at Hampton Caves National Park. The caves had always fascinated me, so getting a job there was a dream come true. One evening, as my shift was coming to an end, my co-worker Ricky muttered under his breath, You know, I just heard we're putting up warning signs near the Falcon Cliff Trailhead because of a recent bear sighting. Really? We haven't had any bear attacks here in ages. I responded with genuine surprise. We joked about the bears potentially signing up for online courses on etiquette before parting ways at the end of our shift. Dusk had fallen as I stepped outside, and the world had taken on that eerie twilight shade. The familiar outline of the park transformed into an alien landscape, shadows playing tricks with my eyes. It was then that I noticed something strange near the distant tree line. A figure of immense size and odd proportions lumbered from behind one tree to another with an unusual gait. When it emerged from behind another tree closer to me, its horrifying features dawned on me. It was something like a massive canine standing upright, its muscular front limbs looking unnervingly human-like. Thick black fur covered its entire body, razor-sharp claws protruded from gigantic paw-like hands and its snout dripped saliva onto deadly fawn-filled jaws. As if sensing my observation, it halted, and peered grotesquely into my direction with those blood-red eyes full of malicious intent. My instincts screamed at me to run for help and alert security or call 911. Still, fear rooted me on the spot while logic told me no one would believe what I'd seen. With light-footed agility that seemed impossible for its size, the creature stalked closer. The deliberate and stealthy movements between the trees asserted that it was a seasoned hunter, ambush predator of the highest, most lethal order. Circling ever closure, I began to hear its heavy breathing from a mere couple of meters from my left. All I could think was... This must be an animal that's escaped from some secret lab or cruel genetic experiment. The sheer terror of inevitability washed over me as I grappled with the undeniable fear that I would not escape this encounter unscathed, or worse, alive. In my panic, my hand swept around to my hip where I usually kept a pocket knife but found nothing. Had I removed it earlier when cleaning my desk? Desperate. I heaved a hefty rock from the ground and hurled it at my monstrous pursuer. The rock connected with the side of its head, and a guttural snarl escaped its maw. Hissing menacingly, it lunged forward towards me. The enormous beast's jaws snapped shut inches from my face as I instinctively dodged out of its path. Now certain of my immediate doom, my body took precedence over reason. An adrenaline-fueled energy coursed through me as I bolted into the nearby woods in terror. Behind me, the half-man, half-canine colossus crashed after me through trees, branches snapping under its merciless pursuit. My heart pounded against my chest, leaving no room for coherent thoughts. Only instincts to survive drove me forward without direction or strategy. I sprinted through the forest, my breath ragged and lungs burning with exertion. The half-man, half-canine monstrosity continued its relentless pursuit. 
As I tried to find an escape route in the moonlit woods, my mind raced for a solution. However, instead of hoping someone could help, I feared the idea of involving anyone else in this bizarre and horrifying encounter. Suddenly, the beast lunged again, its jaws snapping shut just over my shoulder. I stumbled and fell to the ground, scrambling desperately to get back on my feet. I noticed a fallen tree up ahead and decided to make a desperate attempt to hide behind it. As I reached the tree and crawled behind it, I held my breath, trying my best not to give away my position. The lumbering beast growled nearby as it searched for me. Time seemed to stand still as I lay there, sweat pouring down my face while praying that it would pass me by. After what felt like an eternity, the lumbering dogman moved further away from me. Its guttural growls slowly faded into the distance until they were barely audible. Cautiously, I remained hidden for a few more minutes before deciding that it was safe enough for me to attempt an escape. Using every ounce of strength left in me, I stood up shakily and started limping towards what appeared to be a road several hundred meters away. My heart pounded in trepidation as fear held sway over any other feeling or thought. When I staggered onto the road, luck shone upon me. A truck was approaching with headlights on full beam. The driver slammed on their brakes as they caught sight of me stumbling into their path. What's going on? yelled the driver as he exited the truck and rushed towards me. Please! I wheezed between ragged breaths. Help me! There's something horrible in the woods and it's trying to kill me! I noticed the driver looking at my disheveled state, unsure of whether to believe me or not. Regardless of his doubts, he helped me into the cab and drove quickly away from the spot. Once we were driving away, I described my horrifying ordeal with the dogman to the truck driver. He listened intently, his concern evident on his face. Well, he finally said as we sped down the highway, I've never seen anything like that before, but it sounds like you barely escaped with your life. Yeah, I replied hoarsely. I don't know what that thing was. A dogman or something? It doesn't make any sense. The truck driver shook his head slowly before continuing. Whatever it was, it's best if you put distance between yourself and it. Just be glad you survived this encounter. As the truck hurtled into the night, leaving behind a trail of dust from the speeding tires, I glanced back twice, searching for any sign of that terrible creature. Although a sense of relief flooded through me as I realized the dogman was no longer chasing after me, I couldn't suppress a shudder at the memory of its horrifying visage and predatory pursuit. Over the next few days, people heard about my harrowing tale whispered across town, the story of a young man who came face to face with a mythical beast and emerged alive if not unscathed. But despite whispers turning to gossip and idle chatter as time passed by, their voices could not conceal one stark truth. I had survived an encounter with a gruesome creature that defied logic or explanation. Though some might call me lucky to have lived through such an ordeal, all I could think about were those who had not been so fortunate. Any creature as bloodthirsty and monstrous as the dogman must surely have left other victims behind, perhaps forever lost to the shadows of the damned forest. And as I looked back upon that fateful night, when terror came crashing through the trees, one thought remained would the dogman continue its relentless hunt for human prey? Or had our meeting somehow altered the course of that horrifying beast, driving it further into the depths of darkness and shadow, never to return? I'm here to tell you something that happened to me not too long ago. It was a night that still haunts me. My name is Ezekiel Hawthorne, and I took a trip with my friend Percival O'Sullivan. We decided to camp in our RV at the Grand Canyon for a few days to unwind from the pressures of work and daily life. 
We reached our campsite late in the afternoon and parked our RV near the edge of the canyon, confident that the nights ahead would be filled with stories and laughter around a bonfire. The first evening was spent grilling steaks, and Percival cracked jokes that had us laughing until our stomachs hurt. On the second day, we ventured off on a hiking trail that took us deep into the canyon. The view was breathtaking, and surprisingly, we hadn't encountered another soul the entire day. As we continued along our path, we stumbled upon an abandoned vehicle at the bottom of a ravine. Its twisted metal frame indicated a terrible accident. We searched for any sign of life, but there was none. Bloodstains painted an ominous picture on dirt-covered windows. Feeling uneasy, we retreated back to our campsite. Later that evening, feeling unnerved by our discovery, we couldn't sleep like before. Suddenly, we heard footsteps approaching our RV from outside. Startled, I peered out of the window and saw what looked like a man approaching us. He appeared as if he'd been through hell-tattered clothes hanging off his body, one leg dragging along in an unnatural manner. We panicked when he tried opening our unlocked door. Thankfully I realized the situation and instinctively slammed it shut before he could enter while Percival rushed to grab his phone to call for help. Sadly we were deep into nature accommodation here and signal reception was non-existent. The man relentlessly clawed at our door like a rabid animal as I struggled to maintain my hold on the door handle. Percival, meanwhile, scoured the RV for anything that could be used as a weapon. He found a rusty pipe under the sink and held it firmly, ready to strike right after exchanging glances with me. With a deep breath, I flung the door open and Percival swung the pipe with all the force he could muster. It connected heavily with the man's skull, but he didn't fall. Instead, driven by pain or anger or perhaps both, he became even more aggressive and kept advancing towards Percival. Out of nowhere, we heard a set of four gunshots ring in the air. A group of park rangers had come to our rescue after hearing our desperate shouts for help. The man fell back as each bullet made contact with his chest. However much to our horror, he writhed and clawed at us while on his knees as though nothing happened. As he continued to claw at us, one of the park rangers shouted to cover our heads and fired another shot, this time directly to the man's forehead, finally stopping him. The park ranger stood there, looking just as shocked and horrified as we were. They cautiously approached the man's now motionless body. I let go of the door handle, my legs trembling from the intense situation we just experienced. One of the park rangers asked if we were okay, but all I could do was nod in response, still trying to catch my breath. The group of rangers debated amongst themselves whether they should investigate this strange man or report it immediately to their superiors and wait for further instructions. They finally decided that they should take us out of here and bring us somewhere safe before anything else happened. We were escorted back to the ranger station where we answered all their questions about what occurred. They informed us that this man matched the descriptions of a fugitive who had recently escaped from a high-security prison in the area. The fugitive was incredibly dangerous and criminally insane which could explain his relentless attacks and resistance to pain. At first, it was terrifying knowing that this man had targeted us out of all the people here, but we expressed our gratitude for being alive. During our conversations with the rangers, they mentioned that two other campers were found dead earlier today in a site nearby ours. They believed that these incidents were connected because both showed obvious signs of attack from the same man. We couldn't help but feel a wave of sorrow for those campers and their grieving families. Their happy vacation had turned into a nightmare in a matter of minutes. As for us, we couldn't dare return to our RV as it was now stained with dreadful memories we wanted desperately to forget. Finally, local law enforcement caught wind of what happened and made sure that our statement was taken. 
We were reassured that the man was indeed dead, and we had nothing else to worry about. An investigation into his escape and the possibility of any accomplices was launched. The rangers made arrangements for us to stay the night at a motel nearby. As the sun set on this fateful day, Percival and I were left to process everything that happened. We were grateful to have survived, but it would undoubtedly take some time for us to regain a sense of normalcy. We couldn't help but think of those whom we lost in this ordeal. Our lives may have continued, but we would never forget the terror of that night or the lives that were shattered by this madman's rampage. The remaining days of our vacation were spent close to home, away from the wilderness, and surrounded by friends and family who offered comfort and support. In time, we managed to move forward, but our lives had been changed forever. Every now and then, while lying awake at night, I still hear the sound of frantic clawing at my door. And even though I know it's just my imagination playing tricks on me, I can't help but remember those horrifying moments when our lives hung in the balance. I remember the exact moment my world turned upside down. Staring down at my favorite burger joint splattered with blood, the stench filling the air. My name is Reese Carver, a Navy SEAL tasked with what was supposed to be a routine covert mission. The operation was in truth or consequences, New Mexico, a peculiar town with an equally peculiar name. My team and I moved through the quaint streets, admiring the historic buildings and eye-catching murals. We had specific orders to apprehend a dangerous individual involved in shady dealings. Reese, are you ready for this? My teammate, Albin Sapphire, whispered as we took positions outside an old warehouse. I smirked. Come on, Albin, is the bear Catholic? Does the Pope? Well, never mind that. Albin shot me a puzzled yet amused glance. Moments later, something felt off, like someone, or something, was watching us. The hair on my neck stood up, my gut screamed danger. Bursting through the warehouse doors, we found nothing but empty crates and old machinery, certainly not what we expected from a potential criminal hideout. Suddenly, a blood-curdling scream echoed into the night. Racing toward it, we found a gruesome scene. The target we'd been pursuing savagely mutilated by an enormous creature with shimmering scales and gnarled horns atop its head. Its wicked eyes sliced through the darkness as it observed us before slinking into the shadows. We tried to comprehend what just happened. Every single one of us was astounded. Okay. Albin began shakily as he turned to me, his voice caught in his throat. Let's reassess this situation. Our mission had changed. We needed answers. We spent days investigating possible links between our murdered suspect and this unspeakable monster. The townspeople only spoke in hushed voices about an ancient folktale, but no substantial leads emerged. Then it struck again. A local farmer's body was discovered near a stream, grotesquely disfigured and covered in unmistakable claw marks. It seemed as though the creature was toying with us. As we studied the details of each encounter, we realized this beast could not be stopped by conventional means. It existed solely to inflict pain and suffering, to consume and destroy. I don't get it. I mumbled under my breath, exasperated. Why aren't the authorities on this? Albin shook his head, staring blankly at the glossy photographs spread out before him. Maybe they don't know about it, or maybe they're afraid. We devised a plan, our best shot at cornering the creature and learning its true nature. Albin would be bait in a desolate area while I monitored from a hidden position with a high-powered tranquilizer gun, a temporary measure to immobilize the beast. Albin left me with one last joke for good measure. 
Reese, you owe me big time after this. I expect you to buy me the most expensive steak dinner in town. I grinned as Albin stepped out into the open field. The sun receded below the horizon, bathing the landscape in darkness, an eerie prelude to what would surely come next. Minutes felt like hours as adrenaline coursed through my veins. From my concealed position behind a pile of rocks, I watched in anticipation for any sign of movement. A blood-curdling howl echoed through the air, sending tremors down my spine. The creature revealed itself, an horrifying amalgamation of flesh, scales, and ferocious intent. Albin stood his ground while I took careful aim, my breath steady, my finger hovering over the trigger, still hoping against hope that this nightmare could be stopped without further bloodshed. But then, the creature lunged viciously at Albin. At that exact moment, my finger tightened around the trigger, and the tranquilizer dart shot through the air with deadly accuracy. Just as it struck its target, the creature's razor-sharp claws carved through Albin's flesh, leaving an unmistakable trail of torrents of blood and pain. Despite the pain, Albin stumbled backward as I frantically lowered my weapon and sprinted toward him. The creature was momentarily incapacitated, but we couldn't take any chances. It had taken one swipe at my friend, and I couldn't bear to think of what would have happened if it had gotten another chance. Albin swayed, his face contorted in pain. Reese, go on, he grunted. I'll slow it down. Get help. I hesitated for a moment, torn between my loyalty to Albin and my fear of leaving him alone with the monstrous creature. No, we'll call for help together, I insisted. As we backed away from the motionless creature, I pulled out my phone and quickly dialed emergency services. I breathlessly recounted what had happened while glancing around nervously, in case the tranquilizer's effects wore off sooner than we hoped. We need help immediately, I implored into the phone. My friend has been gravely injured by an unknown animal. We're at. The line crackled and went dead before I could finish giving our coordinates. Panic surged through me as I shook my phone, desperately trying to reconnect. Reese, Albin panted beside me, clutching his torn flesh. His voice was weak but determined. There's no time. Leave me here. I'll catch up once help arrives. Knowing that each second put both of us in greater danger, I hesitated for another moment before nodding reluctantly at Albin's insistence. Est he stay safe. I stammered, my eyes locked on the still form of the creature as I backed away from Albin and hurried to find help elsewhere. It took what felt like an eternity before I stumbled upon a group of hunters who were camping nearby. Between labored breaths, I explained the situation to them, emphasizing the urgency of aiding an injured Albin. They exchanged wary glances before deciding to help me. When we returned to the scene with more tranquilizer guns and medical supplies, however, both Albin and the creature were gone. Trails of blood marked their separate paths, leading in opposite directions. The hunters followed the creature's path, vowing to permanently eliminate the threat it posed as I chased after Albin's bloody trail, praying that he had found safety. After an intense search, I found him in a makeshift shelter formed by fallen branches. His wounds were crudely bandaged with torn clothing. Seeing him weak and in pain nearly broke me, but there was no time to waste. We had to get out of there. The rescue mission seemed like a blur as we rushed Albin to the nearest hospital for proper treatment. Doctors tended to his wounds while I paced outside the room the events of the night replaying over and over in my mind. Once his condition stabilized, Albin was transferred to another hospital away from our hometown. Word had quickly spread about the gruesome attack he had endured. Though it had happened only a few nights ago, 
It felt like a lifetime had passed since our efforts to confront and catch the beast ended so disastrously. Today, I cautiously approach Alban's hospital room with gifts and words of encouragement for my friend. As he opens his eyes and manages a weak smile at my presence, I know that I'll never again take our friendship lightly or our lives for granted. I'll tirelessly search for answers regarding the monstrous creature that attacked us, knowing full well that if it roams free, more lives will be endangered. While I may never truly understand its nature or motivation, one thing is certain. I won't rest until this living nightmare is put to an end, ensuring no one else suffers the same horrible fate as my brave friend Albin who stood up against fear on that fateful night. A cold, freezing sensation washed over me as I zipped up my jacket and fought against the wind. It was late October in the Rocky Mountains, and I was getting ready to start my two-week solo hike through a remote portion of the wilderness. My name is Byron Hartley, an introverted outdoor enthusiast who spent his life working as an editor from a small apartment. These excursions were my retreat from the hustle and bustle of everyday life. The plan this time was to reach the Peyton Valley, a scarcely visited area of untouched natural beauty that I had always dreamt about exploring. So you're really going all by yourself, huh, Byron? asked Aaron, the ranger stationed nearby. He was filling out some paperwork for my hiking permit when he looked up with a quizzical smile. Yeah. I replied sheepishly. It's how I usually do it. Just me and my thoughts. Well, be careful out there, he warned. Folks have been saying they've seen some strange tracks lately. Maybe bears are getting a little too close for comfort. I nodded in understanding and reassured Aaron that I would take all necessary precautions before venturing into the wilderness. The first few days were just like any other backpacking trip. Beautiful vistas, crisp mountain air, and evenings spent gazing into the fire with a sense of inner peace that only nature could provide. One frigid morning after almost a week on the trails, I came across something I couldn't quite explain. Everything around me looked normal until I spotted blood splatters splashed across the nearby foliage. Following the trail of blood with growing unease, my heart sank as it led me to an unexpected site, an abandoned campsite with signs of scuffle evident amongst upturned gear and strewn belongings. Out of concern for whoever might have suffered here, I pulled out my phone to call 911, but there wasn't any signal in the deep wilderness. There was no bear attack here, something else had happened. Feeling a heavy sense of dread, I continued hiking with my eyes peeled for anything unusual, my mind racing with possibilities. Hours later, while setting up camp, I noticed a peculiar arrangement of branches and rocks close by. It looked as if someone had attempted to build some makeshift shelter out of sheer desperation. As the days pressed on, I stumbled upon more clues, another torn tent, shattered pieces of gear, and more blood. The sensation of being watched and followed stalked me through the forest as I tried to convince myself that it was purely paranoia seeping in. One evening while preparing dinner over a weak fire, a distant sound stopped me in my tracks, faint shrieks echoing through the valley beneath the growing howl of the wind. The terror in those screams sent an icy shiver down my spine, they were close by but not close enough for rescue or retreat. I don't know who's out there, but please stay safe. I whispered into the wind, taking solace and voicing my concern aloud. A few days later found me crouching behind a large boulder amidst a dense grove of trees. Sounds of crunching leaves and labored breathing approached, stirring up every nerve ending in my body. Risking a cautious peek from behind that barrier, 
My eyes widened at the unexpected sight before me. An enormous hairy creature lumbered into view. It stood taller than any human I'd ever seen and moved with an eerie intelligence I couldn't fathom. It dragged something heavy through the dirt and leaves alongside it, an unknown horror hidden beneath that enormous form. Gripping my pocket knife tightly with trembling hands for any semblance of protection, I watched its massive frame move gracefully out of sight. The desperate screams from earlier still echoed hauntingly within me as I realized the terrors lurking in these woods. Panic welled up inside me and dark thoughts swarmed my mind. I knew now that something horrifying was preying on these paths, stalking victims lost within its wooded hunting grounds. Mind racing in fear, I gathered my belongings as hastily and quietly as possible, ripping my tent down without a glance back at that gruesome sight. My only goal now was to survive, to get as far away from that thing as possible. With each passing hour, my fear intensified and the urgency to escape increased. I avoided lingering in any one area, fearing the gruesome creature would reappear and claim me as one of its victims. My steps hurried along, blindly following a seldom-used trail that led deeper into the forest. As hours stretched into days, my body weakened from exhaustion and malnutrition. I stumbled upon a group who were camping near a lake. Their faces showed confusion and concern as they questioned me about my disheveled appearance. The leader of the group, an older man named Samuel, took charge, effectively surrounding me with their resources and protectiveness. They offered me food and water, along with a safe haven for the night. Please call for help, I whispered as their gazes locked onto mine. Samuel agreed to hike back to their car and call for help while the rest of his group stayed with me. We formed a small fire circle near our temporary campsite as darkness descended upon us. I informed them of my encounters, how all sounds shared roots in blood-curdling fear. My voice shook as I recalled the massive hairy creature that possessed both strength and intelligence beyond human comprehension. Their eyes widened, disbelief evident upon their faces. We sat in tight-knit vigilance throughout the night, alertness heightened by unexpected rustlings in the trees around us. Moments before dawn broke, terror gripped our campsite when Samuel's anguished cries pierced through the silence. Our attempts to locate him proved futile, until our eyes fell upon something horrific in the underbrush. Samuel's lifeless body torn apart like every other bloody remnant I'd come across in these cursed woods. As fear escalated into horrified screams and scattered chaos amongst our group, I knew there was little hope for survival if we remained separated. Clinging to a last shred of hope, we seized our best weaponry, sticks, stones, and formed a tight, defensive circle. When the creature broke through the otherwise serene canopy, our shrieks intensified. Speed and accuracy were critical now, as we pelted the monstrous figure with everything we had. Its menacing form wavered under our relentless barrage, yet it remained unrelenting in its pursuit. But to our ultimate dismay, no human-made effort could halt this unstoppable predator. We fought with all we had to remain united and alive. The creature's relentless advance brought only agony to those it touched, evidenced by their piercing screams filling the air. Our weakening force had no option but to scatter in all directions soon after that nightfall. I heard cries of pain and despair disappearing behind me as I sprinted through the forest underbrush, desperate to stay ahead of my impending doom. Miraculously, I reached the edge of that dark wood, pushing through and emerging into a familiar meadow. Why it did not follow me beyond that boundary remains unknown. Law enforcement scoured the area afterward following fractured paths left by me and others who'd barely escaped with our lives. 
Grief swelled for those who hadn't, including Samuel and several members of his group, forming tight bonds among survivors compelled by shared nightmarish memories. I spent years afterwards trying to come to terms with those horrific events, avoiding any talk of folklore or urban legends. While I never confronted or investigated my monstrous tormentor again, I couldn't ignore their presence in my life years later. I never dared to step foot in that forest again, forced into acceptance that there are natural perils humans cannot withstand or comprehend brute forces imprinted onto minds scarred by merciless terror that none should ever bear witness to. The images of lost friends still haunt me, but we remember them with respect and recognition for tales untold due to consequences born from nature's insurmountable horrors. As a search and rescue officer for the U.S. Forest Service, my day usually begins with a hot cup of robust coffee and skimming through the mountain news. A lot of occurrences in these parts involve missing hikers or stranded travelers, but I never expected that this would be the day that everything would change for me. My buddy Kevin and I got dispatched early in the morning to an abandoned campground at Devil's Den State Park. Apparently, our buddies at the police department had stumbled upon what they described as an animal attack or something freakier, but they needed our expertise on the terrain and wildlife to assess the situation. I couldn't shake off a strange feeling about this case, a gnawing uneasiness deep within. Yet, I brushed it off as just another day in my line of work. Pulling up to the scene... Kevin let out an unconventional chuckle. This place looks like some Halloween horror movie set, huh? He wasn't wrong. Overgrown, derelict camping amenities and spiderwebs covered broken lanterns. Almost comically eerie. We made our way towards the campsite where we were supposed to meet with Officer Rick Harrison. As we navigated through the dense brush surrounding our destination, we came across what seemed like an overturned car. The vehicle was completely mutilated, windows shattered, tires torn apart, and long scratches along its exterior. However shocking this sight was, I noticed there were no animal tracks around it, Ah, uh, Reaching deeper into the woods towards our agreed meeting point, we suddenly stumbled upon Officer Harrison's lifeless body sprawled alongside that chilling scene we were called about. Panic shot through us as we approached both him and whatever else was ahead. The gruesome sight was more disturbing than anything either of us had ever seen. Blood splatters littered the campsite creating a genuine crime scene ambience. Rip tents looked like a whirlwind inexorably tore through the area. Unable to contain the bile rising in my throat, I exclaimed, What on earth could have done this? None of us had ever encountered anything that could cause this level of carnage in all our years of service. But there was no time to dwell on it. We needed answers, backup, and an evacuation plan to execute effectively. Kevin immediately radioed for help while I inspected Officer Harrison's body more closely. His wounds were nothing like any bear or mountain lion attack we'd ever seen. Deep gashes engrossed his torso and limbs, seemingly too large to be from an indigenous animal. Unease grew inside of me as pieces began falling into place, until I saw it, a hulking silhouette stalking us through the trees at the peripherals of my vision. Terror washed over me in a frigid wave. The thing lunged towards Kevin with predatory speed, knocking the radio out of his hand. I could barely register what had just transpired as its presence loomed over us like death itself, animal instincts coursing relentlessly through every fiber of my being. This entity seemed almost human but distorted, like a twisted caricature of some dark folklore creature. Desperate and fearful for our lives, I managed to grab Kevin before sprinting deeper into the woods. 
My earlier years on the track team paid off as we narrowly escaped the grasp of whatever monstrosity pursued us. But our nightmare wasn't over yet. Gasping for breath, Kevin choked out between pants. We need to find that radio and call for help. His terror mirrored mine as if we shared a single heartbeat pounding furiously in unison. Knowing that our lives depended on retracing our steps into that campsite turned battlefield felt nearly impossible. I didn't want to provoke our stalker any further or dare imagine coming face to face with him again. But my instincts kicked in. We had no other choice. Fighting back the primal dread welling within us, we prepared to return to the scene of utter destruction. As we took our first steps back in that direction, there was a rustling sound, one that filled me with more unease than anything I've ever experienced. The creature emerged from the shadows again, this time even more menacing and unpredictable. It barred its jagged teeth and let out a bone-chilling roar. Our end was nearer than ever, every step forward sealed by fate sharper than its claws. Without a moment's hesitation, I shouted at Kevin, Run to the ranger station and get help. I'll try to keep it away from you. Kevin nodded, understanding the seriousness of the situation. He took off towards the ranger station as quickly as his legs would carry him, hoping to get assistance for our dire predicament. As for me, I knew that I had one goal, distract the creature long enough to give Kevin a fighting chance. My heart hammered in my chest as I picked up a nearby rock and hurled it at the monstrous thing. The rock connected with its head, causing it to let out an angry snarl and shift its focus onto me. The creature lunged at me again, its inhuman features even more horrifying up close it stood about ten feet tall with ashen skin stretched thin over sinewy muscles. Its eyes were sunken and black like bottomless pits that would consume all light. Its elongated limbs were tipped with sharp claws that slashed through the air mercilessly. My survival instincts kicked into high gear. Knowing I couldn't hope to fight this thing physically, I frantically searched my surroundings for anything that might help keep it at bay or slow it down while we waited for help to arrive. I noticed a small cave entrance hidden behind some thick bushes about fifty feet away from where I stood. I sprinted towards the opening and squeezed myself inside, hoping to either hide or at least find a defensible position within the narrow confines of the confined space. The cave was dark and damp inside, but provided some cover as I listened to the heavy footsteps of the creature approaching outside. Just as my thoughts turned to Kevin and whether or not he managed to reach safety in time, there was a sudden eruption of gunshots echoing from outside the cave, followed closely by human voices shouting orders. Moments later, an unfamiliar group of people dressed in tactical gear and armed with semi-automatic rifles emerged, shining flashlights throughout the area. I peered out of the cave cautiously catching glimpses of the creature thrashing wildly among the tangled foliage as it was relentlessly pummeled by a barrage of gunfire. One of the team members noticed my presence and motioned for me to come out, giving me a nod of reassurance. As I emerged into the open, I saw Kevin rushing back towards us, alongside two other park rangers who wore expressions of urgent intensity. The tactical team finally managed to subdue the creature, their weapons ushering its deathly collapse onto the forest floor in a heap of lifeless flesh. Upon regrouping and confirming that we were all unscathed, at least physically, we learned that this special unit had been tracking this unknown creature that had left a present trail of carnage across several national parks. We were lucky they arrived when they did thanks to Kevin's quick thinking to call for help. In ensuring our survival, these strangers had brought an end to the relentless reign of terror caused by this ungodly monster. The situation created bonds fueled by shared trauma that would endure long after our encounter in the dreadful forest. 
We assisted in wrapping up what had happened by providing our account and assisting in any way possible from there on. We mourned the loss of Officer Harrison and any other victims claimed by the hideous creature. Ultimately, we could only move forward, bearing with ourselves memories we wished we could forget, but knowing that our survival was a sign that hope always remained steadfast amidst chaos. And as for me, I continued on with my service as a park ranger, ever vigilant, but now harboring a newfound respect for the unknown dangers lurking beneath the tranquil illusions offered by nature's deceptive beauty. Walking into the dimly lit library, I glanced around, taking in the smell of old books and dust. My name's Nolan Chambers, and I was hired to research an unsolved case for an upcoming documentary. I never believed in supernatural stuff, so when a colleague had mentioned the case involving a massive, hairy bipedal creature, I couldn't help but roll my eyes. As I leafed through countless newspaper clippings and police reports, the sheer amount of detail in the witness accounts kept me intrigued. They described fleeting encounters with a creature lurking in the shadows of Newberry Forest. A quiet hum of disbelief traveled down my spine, but I still maintained my skepticism. Then came a sudden encounter with an old man named Dorsey Forrester. He shuffled towards me, his slow gait and hushed voice lending him an air of mystery. We swapped introductions and found a common purpose. We were both searching for proof that the case was genuine. However, Dorsey seemed more driven to prove it was real rather than dismiss it as gossip. I tell ya, son, listen to people round here to understand their fear, he whispered, referencing nearby hikers who were found mauled by an unknown predator. Dorsey's words echoed as I interviewed locals around Newberry Forest, each one dejectedly shaking their head, unable to offer any evidence against bizarre reports of a hairy behemoth haunting their woods. It felt uncomfortably surreal for someone so rooted in facts. Over time, complex emotions plagued me. Curiosity in every sighting report tugged at me like a child seeking attention. And then... That fateful night unfolded. Dorsey and I decided to camp near where profuse attacks occurred. As the sun dipped below the horizon and darkness enveloped us, our puny campfire illuminated curious shadows on nearby trees adding a sinister feel to our already heightened senses. Every twig crack, rustle, and breeze was a threat. Then it came, an unmistakable roar that seemed to vibrate from every direction. Dorsey cowered against the tree while I managed to grasp my handgun. As adrenaline raced through our veins, a muscled Goliath emerged from the tree line. Fearful eyes glanced upon a creature defying logic, the apocalyptic horror I'd seen only in nightmares, towering, despite its hunched stance, with mangled hair covering every inch of its biblical form. Its eyes pierced the darkness exuding a primal hunger that sickened our souls. The creature approached menacingly, each thunderous step a cacophony announcing doom. A newfound courage sent me charging towards the beast, firing my gun with precise aim as it met the monster's advancing figure. The bullets barely slowed its stride. Run! I yelled to Dorsey, who sprinted like a man half his age. Ingeniously steering through the woods, we pushed every muscle to its breaking point amidst plumes of desperation resonating through our chests. Dorsey hurtled over a rock looking back as I clumsily collided and knocked both of us down into murky swamp water. Covered in mud yet untouched by the now elusive beast, we stumbled onto a dirt road ahead of us, the wretched stench of carrion overpowering our senses. As we limped on together, I felt an unnerving shift within me as the line between skeptic and believer blurred with an intensity that made me question everything I knew. Our campfire dimmed, but the looming threat kept us wide awake. 
With each passing minute, Dorsey and I became more conscious of our vulnerability in the surrounding darkness. The terrifying creature's roar echoed in our minds. Why don't we just call for help? whispered Dorsey, his hands trembling. We're too far out in the woods for anyone to hear us. I replied with a sense of urgency. Besides, no one would believe us even if they did. As we continued down the dirt road, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched. We heard movement around us a sign that the creature could reappear at any moment. Our only option was to keep moving and hope to stumble upon civilization before it caught up with us. Suddenly, a young woman burst from the shadows and stumbled in front of us. The look on her face mirrored our own fear, and she panted heavily as she tried to catch her breath. Please, she gasped. You've got to help me. It attacked my family back at our cabin. Dorsey and I exchanged glances. We knew all too well what she was talking about. Ignoring our desire to flee, we felt compelled to help her face this horror together. Maybe there was strength in numbers. Cautiously, we followed her back to the cabin, which had been reduced to shambles. Blood stained the walls and floor as her cries grew louder, confirming our worst fears. Her family didn't stand a chance against such an abomination. There has to be someone nearby who can come help, said the young woman through tears. I nodded and pulled out my phone from my pocket. Its feeble signal offered little hope, yet I tried nonetheless. Miraculously, after several attempts, an emergency dispatcher answered my call. Amidst stuttering breaths and incoherent descriptions, I told the person on the other end where we were, praying that help would come quickly. By some divine fortune, a group of armed men arrived at our location within the hour. They must have been quite close. They listened to our accounts with visible skepticism, but agreed to protect us as they investigated the scene. As they surveyed the area, an older man among them approached and introduced himself as a nearby hunter who had heard of similar incidents around these parts. Before we could fully understand what was happening, the creature ambushed us once again with a growl so powerful that it sent shivers down our spines. The hunters raised their weapons and fired, their rounds effortlessly hitting their target. But just like before, their assault did little to deter the creature's relentless charge. Seeing no other choice, I grabbed Dorsey and the young woman by the hand and led them in a desperate sprint back to the dirt road. Behind us, Gunfire continued to ring out until it became nothing more than a distant echo. We finally reached a small town just as the sun's pale rays peaked over the horizon. We were battered, bruised, and covered in mud but alive. In the coming days, we heard from authorities that while they had found evidence of our ordeal, bloodied cabins and spent shell casings, there was no trace of the creature itself. Many dismissed our story as hysteria or pranksters in costumes. Despite this dismissal, Dorsey and I knew better. The young woman who had survived alongside us did too. And so we moved forward with caution, knowing that somewhere out there in those woods lurked a force beyond reason or understanding. Our lives were forever changed by its presence, for better or worse, and we never forget those we lost on that dreadful night. But if nothing else, this harrowing experience taught U.S. of humankind's innate capacity for courage in moments of sheer terror. It reminded us that we must stand together, even when the darkness seeks to consume us. I want to share something that happened to me a few summers back when I was camping in an RV in the Allegheny National Forest. It seemed like the perfect getaway, until I stumbled upon something I wish I hadn't. Man, this is incredible! My close friend, Wilbur Higginbottom, said as we were setting up our campsite. The fresh air and the vastness of the woods, there's nothing like it! 
my mind and my body agreed wholeheartedly with his statement. We spent our first day hiking and exploring the dense forest while sharing some laughs along the way. Wilbur, did you hear about the grasshopper that walked into a bar? Bartender says, hey, we got a drink named after you. Grasshopper replies, you got a drink named Steve? We both burst out laughing. It felt good to be away from our mundane schedules. Our second day at camp started similarly. We hiked further down an unmarked trail that seemed just as mysterious as it was exciting. A few miles along, we discovered a small cave hidden off to the side. Its entrance was barely noticeable among the thick foliage. Curiosity peaked. Wilbur and I ventured in cautiously with our flashlights. The cave was damp and dark, but deeper inside we could see something that glinted against our lights. The sight before us was horrifying, a makeshift room, drenched in dried blood and chilling evidence of violent acts committed within its walls. Too disturbed to linger any longer, we turned back towards daylight and briskly returned to the safety of our RV. That night, with a mixture of horror and disbelief lingering in our thoughts, either Wilbur nor I could find solace in sleep. We agreed early on that we wouldn't call for help or inform anyone right away. It might have been risky since whoever did those things in the cave could still be lurking nearby. We decided to leave the following morning, but fate had other plans in store. The next day, while making preparations to leave, a man appeared in our campsite. He was tall with sharp facial features, and his cold gray eyes seemed devoid of any soul. He didn't say anything. He just fixated on me with an unsettling gaze that sent shivers down my spine. Silently, the man advanced towards us. Gripped by fear, Wilbur fumbled for our small revolver we brought for emergencies. As the man approached, I saw Wilbur's hands shaking as he held the revolver. Time seemed to slow down. Hey! Stay back! Wilbur yelled attempting to deter the man. The man continued his advance without even acknowledging Wilbur's warning. We had no choice but to defend ourselves. Wilbur fired a shot, hitting the man in the leg. He fell to the ground, writhing in pain but still maintaining that cold and emotionless stare fixed on me. We took this opportunity to stumble back towards our RV. We both knew we needed help, not only for our own safety but for anyone else who could stumble upon that terrible cave and become embroiled in this nightmare. Fortunately, we had a weak cell phone signal. I called 911, gasping as I relayed what had occurred, from finding the horrifying scene in the cave to encountering this menacing man now incapacitated nearby. The operator assured us that help was on its way and instructed us to stay in our vehicle, until they arrived. Locked inside our RV, we anxiously watched as the man remained on the ground. Law enforcement officers soon appeared, cautiously subduing and arresting him, followed by paramedics who tended to his leg wound. Detectives questioned us extensively about our discoveries. They informed us that they had found evidence of dreadful acts inside the cave. It appeared that multiple victims had been tortured and killed there over a significant period of time. Unfortunately, much like us, these poor souls had been deemed missing persons due to their remote hiking location, away from civilization and any hope for rescue, by a cruel individual who preyed on unsuspecting campers. Though we wished we could forget everything we went through and the horrors we had witnessed, that person who was captured became a notorious figure within law enforcement circles and on the evening news, the tragic story refused to fade away. Wilbur and I struggled with memories of those terrifying days spent away from the mundane. As we attempted to process the events, we could only hope that justice would be served and that the man responsible would pay for his crimes. Eventually, during the man's criminal trial, we learned more about him. Known as the Hiker Hunter, he had been a loner with a twisted, sadistic mind who sought isolated campers as his victims. 
His calculated attacks and grisly murders had left a string of cold cases in his wake, until our fateful encounter. It is chilling to think about how close Wilbur and I came to becoming yet another nameless victim on that grisly list, with no one left to remember us. Though those terrifying days still haunt us, we take solace in knowing that our actions brought an end to the hiker hunter's reign of terror, and in remembering those victims who weren't as fortunate as us. May they finally rest in peace. It was one of those cases that made me question why I chose this line of work. You see, I'm a small-town cop named Michael Dunhill, and I've seen my fair share of oddities. But this one, oh boy this one took the cake. When it began, nothing seemed out of place just another day at the office. Then again, the slow build-up to a nightmare is always painfully ordinary. The first hint that something strange was afoot came during an unusual conversation with my partner, Linda Myers, also an officer in our sleepy little town. We were grabbing coffee at the local cafe when she mentioned overhearing a rather odd story from one of the waitresses named Margot Katz. Margot had found a dead bird on her doorstep that morning, surrounded by a meticulously drawn pattern that she didn't recognize nor understand. Chuckling at Linda's offbeat sense of humor, I offered my usual witty remark and moved on to other topics without much thought. A few days later, while patrolling Main Street late at night, I came across something that made my heart skip several beats, an eerily similar pattern scrawled onto the sidewalk outside Mrs. Donovan's bakery. The difference? This time it surrounded a mutilated raccoon, the crime scene unnerved me to my core. There was no denying that something sinister was lurking in our quiet town. Bringing up my concerns during a department meeting and describing the gruesome discoveries we'd found thus far, the chief responded with skepticism, unfortunately bringing levity to the situation with another light-hearted joke. I decided to take matters into my own hands and began investigating further, Delving into old newspaper archives and long-forgotten case reports from nearby towns revealed an eerily similar pattern of occurrences. Bizarre animal murders followed by equally gruesome human casualties. During my search for information surrounding the strange happenings in the town and its vicinity, I stumbled upon a discussion forum for paranormal enthusiasts. Nothing caught my eye until I came across a peculiar post from a user claiming to be from my town. A post that described, in chilling detail, the peculiar patterns I had discovered surrounding the dead animals. The user speculated that our uninvited guest was a man, a man with dark eyes and an unnerving grin. No one knew his name or how he came to possess such twisted, dark inclinations. As the days passed, every agonizing lead I'd poured through led to yet another unanswered question. And as the sun began to set one evening, I was struck with utter disbelief. There on the pavement outside my home was the telltale pattern drawn next to a dismembered cat. With haste, I jumped in my cruiser and sped back to the station, gun in tow. Bursting into the chief's office, I pleaded with him to take my findings seriously and issue new precautions for officers patrolling alone during graveyard shifts. Although reluctant at first, he eventually composed a memorandum notifying the entire department of the potential danger lurking among us. The next night would prove to be pivotal. Two officers responded separately to vague noise complaints coming from old Marley's abandoned farmhouse, which sat on a deserted piece of land just beyond town limits. To our horror, upon entering the dilapidated home, they discovered what could only be described as the work of evil incarnate mangled bodies strewn about like discarded trash, all adorned in chillingly familiar patterns drawn around each one. The rest of us instantly converged on their location, cautiously combing through every nook and cranny of the farmhouse. Weapons at the ready, fingers nervously dancing upon triggers. The air outside seemed eerily quiet for what felt like an eternity. 
Not even the sound of gravel crunching under our boots resonated through those oppressive walls. As we continued our search through the old farmhouse, a fellow officer named Jim found a hidden door leading to a dimly lit basement. With worried glances exchanged between us, we carefully descended the stairs, prepared for what unimaginable horrors might be awaiting us below. The smell hit us first an overwhelming stench of putrefaction and coppery blood that gagged even the most hardened among our ranks. In the center of this underground lair was a disturbing scene, a makeshift operating table where a lifeless body lay, mutilated beyond recognition. The floor was stained with thick red and contorted limbs lay in heaps around the room. It was evident that our twisted perpetrator had found an outlet for his dark inclinations. Officer Thompson called for backup as we processed the gruesome scene, all of us feeling vulnerable and on edge. We heard a sudden creak from upstairs, snapping us back to full alertness. Was he still here? We crept back up, cautiously scanning our surroundings. We split into pairs to cover more ground and make sure nothing slipped past us. While searching the house's first floor with Officer Rivera by my side, we heard footsteps. We tensed as they grew louder and closer to our position. A figure emerged from the shadows, tall and gaunt with sunken cheeks and long unkempt hair hanging over his wide eyes which stared unblinkingly at us black, emotionless orbs that chilled us to the bone. As he grinned unnervingly at us, it felt like staring into the depths of humanity's darkest nightmares. Without hesitation, Rivera screamed into her radio for help as we drew our weapons and trained them on him but our uninvited guest had no intention of going down without a fight. He lunged at Rivera with a guttural growl, tackling her to the ground before I could react. I aimed my gun at him but couldn't fire without risking hitting Rivera. He was fast and ferocious, digging his nails into her shoulder as she screamed in agony. Backup arrived just in time, storming through the front door with guns drawn. Hearing the commotion, the man suddenly let go of Rivera and darted up the staircase, leaving a bloody trail behind. Officers Harrison and Spencer pursued him as I stayed with Rivera, who was nursing her injured shoulder. Within minutes, a cacophony of gunshots echoed through the house followed by confirmation over the radio that they'd finally subdued our quarry. As we led the assailant from the farmhouse, his hands cuffed and his body writhing angrily against its restraints, we knew that our town would be forever changed by these events. In the days after that haunting night, as if summoned by some macabre force, more stories began to flood in from neighboring towns about similar events unfolding. The man, who still refused to speak or reveal his identity, had left an impression on those who came into contact with him during his transport to a high-security prison facility. Although it didn't bring back those who had been lost in the hideous string of murders and disappearances, knowing that this monster was locked behind bars made all of us breathe a little easier each night. As for myself and my fellow officers at the station, our bonds strengthened in the aftermath both from shared trauma and a newfound sense of duty to protect our community from whatever unimaginable terrors might lurk just around the corner. When I moved into my isolated cabin in the woods, I didn't think much of it. My name is Brett Huxley and as an introvert with a love for privacy, it was perfect. Settling into my new life amidst the trees and peaceful scenes, little did I know how much peace was a luxury I would miss. The first unusual thing happened while I was out collecting firewood for the rapidly approaching winter months. Back at the cabin to break down the wood, I noticed that my axe was covered in a thick, dark substance. It looked like blood, but thicker and stickier than normal. Startled, I decided to wash off my axe before resuming work, vowing to investigate later. 
Days passed uneventfully until during one of the conversations with my quirky neighbor Tiffany McCleary whom I befriended upon arrival here. We both shared anecdotes about life, her fascinating tales of mountain living, and me bragging about success as a graphic designer. Amidst the laughter, she mentioned strange happenings in these woods like strange noises at night. Perhaps it's some undiscovered creature from the depths of these woods, she quipped jokingly, seemingly oblivious to my earlier event. That night, with Tiffany's words playing in my mind, every noise felt magnified and terrifying. The next morning brought no relief as local gossip brimmed with whispers about mutilated wildlife not far from my cabin their bodies brutally mangled beyond recognition. But it wasn't long before things escalated from whispered fear to chilling reality. Out walking one day with Tiffany in tow, we stumbled across another terrifying sight. Human remains littered across the forest floor. Panic welled up within us. Our heartbeats quickened as horror washed over our faces. I'm going to call the police. Tiffany muttered, fumbling for her phone, only to find there was no signal. We decided to head back to the cabin to call for help, wary of our surroundings and filled with dread. As we moved quickly through the forest, desperate to report the grisly scene and maintain a nervous conversation, Tiffany tripped on a branch. Groaning in pain, she assured me it wasn't serious and urged me to continue towards my cabin while she attempted to regain her bearings. Promising to return as soon as I made the call, I stumbled through darkening woods. The sun was setting, casting shadows that swirled around my path and seemed to mock my distress. As I breathlessly burst through the door of my cabin, I dialed emergency services, agitatedly recounting the gruesome discovery and begging for their assistance. The operator listened intently before explaining officers were already en route. News had reached them about similar incidents nearby. She asked me to remain indoors, lock my doors, windows, and await their arrival. After what felt like hours of alternating roving glances between the pitch-black windows and illuminated clock, I heard knocking at the door. Relieved. I flung it open only to be greeted by a scene out of my worst nightmares. A creature towered before me, vaguely humanoid yet highly grotesque with twisted limbs. Its skin resembled tar stretched across a gaunt frame adorned with thick veins pulsating beneath. Its face was a contorted mix of elongated features prominent nostrils hauntingly flaring with each poisonous breath. However, its most terrifying aspect were its eyes. Deep empty voids devoid of empathy or soul stared intently back at mine, whispering secrets from long-forgotten nightmares. My stomach clenched tighter than a vice at this sight. Adrenaline coursed through every vein as terror commandeered control over my senses. Akin to what felt like religious reel and fast-forward, this encounter would prove disastrous. Suddenly aware that due to this close encounter I had completely forgotten about Tiffany terror-stricken I began to anxiously glimpse outside and pray for her safety. However, the creature continued to draw ever closer towards me, forcing me further back indoors as it methodically advanced. In the presence of the monstrous creature, my instincts took over and I decided that I couldn't stay inside my cabin any longer. I needed to find Tiffany and somehow make it to safety. As the abomination took another step toward me, I turned around and ran out the back door. Somehow, I managed to avoid the grasping fingers of the creature. I sprinted through the woods, yelling Tiffany's name in hopes that she would hear me and respond. Every so often... I glanced back to see if the thing was following me. While it was unnervingly fast, it seemed to be just slow enough for me to maintain a reasonable distance away from it. I heard Tiffany's voice in the distance and ran towards her. I found her limping towards me with a tear-streaked face. 
She had heard my screams of her name but had been too injured from her fall to respond with anything more than an agonized whisper. As we came together, we spotted a dirt road at the edge of the woods. It wasn't much, but it could lead us away from this nightmare. As we hobbled down this narrow path trying our best not lean on one another too heavily for support, I was still winded from my frantic escape. While Tiffany's leg was worsening by the minute, our eyes darted back and forth anxiously searching for signs of our pursuer. The animalistic creature was relentless though, hunting us down with an eerily cold-blooded determination fueled by an inscrutable malice. When it finally caught up to us, there was no chance for a fight or even an attempt to reason with this abhorrent being of undeniable darkness as it closed in on us in those final moments when hope had all but fled from our hearts. The creature lunged at Tiffany without warning and mercilessly dug its claws into her abdomen. Blood sprayed everywhere as she let out a gut-wrenching scream. Overcome by a cocktail of terror and desperation, I knew there never was a time for me to seek help but I had to do something. I frantically searched my surroundings for any possible weapon or form of defense when Providence blessed us with an opportunity. A truck turned the corner and veered our way. Waving my arms and yelling to get the driver's attention, I glanced back just in time to see the creature sink its claws deeper into Tiffany, tearing flesh from bone. The driver slammed on his brakes and jumped out. The man retrieved a heavy crowbar from his vehicle and charged at the creature, swinging with tremendous force. With an unsettling screech, our attacker recoiled from Tiffany and turned its cold black eyes on the newcomer. Enraged by the pain inflicted upon it, it raised its talons high readying for a devastating counterattack. It pounced but not fast enough. At that instant, the man lunged forward managing to land a solid blow that incapacitated the beast long enough for all three of us make our hasty escape. Adrenaline kept us going as we clambered into the truck before flooring it away from that abominable creature. Tiffany is no longer with us. The wounds she sustained were too severe. Days after her death, due in part to her physical injuries but primarily caused by the psychological trauma she endured, went by with me still struggling to accept the possibility of life without her. At least we managed to find some semblance of peace knowing that this hunter had become our savior during those perilous moments in which all hope seemed lost. While driving further away from the gruesome nightmare, he introduced himself as Officer Mark Mitchell, the policeman sent Otto investigate after my call. For now, the creature remains hidden within those woods, a fearsome embodiment of otherworldly terror that defies explanation. Perhaps one day, someone will succeed in vanquishing the monstrosity from this world, but until then, people will continue to shudder at dark stories of a malevolent force preying upon unsuspecting victims somewhere deep within nature's shadows. My name is Walton Havisham, and I'm a park ranger in the heart of Colorado. Most days, my job is fairly routine, patrolling trails, keeping an eye on wildlife, and helping lost hikers find their way. This happened to me one afternoon as I was performing my usual duties. That particular day, I was assigned to inspect some of our remote ranger cabins. Everything started off normally. I shared a few friendly conversations with my coworkers before setting off on my ATV at a slow, comfortable pace. The weather was clear and mild, the perfect backdrop for a nice ride. After finishing my inspections at the first couple of cabins, I made my way further into the depths of the forest to reach another cabin that had been out of use during the winter months because it's harder accessibility due to heavy snowfalls. 
Along the way, I came across a fellow ranger named Esther Mayfair who had stopped her vehicle to look at something unusual near one of our monitoring devices arrayed throughout the area. It's been happening for weeks now, she said as she showed me pictures of strange animal footprints. But they just don't add up, too large to be deer and too distorted to be elk. Unsettled by these bizarre tracks in our otherwise idyllic forest, we continued on our respective tasks with Esther heading back towards headquarters, and me pressing on towards the remote cabin. The deeper into the woods I traveled, the stranger things seemed to become. The air felt colder than it should have been for that time of year, and there was an unnerving silence that left me feeling alone and vulnerable. Shaking off my anxieties, I finally arrived at the cabin. As I approached it, I noticed that the door had been torn off its hinges and lay broken on the ground. Had a tree fallen on it during winter storms? No visible signs indicated such damage. Clutching my radio in case of trouble, I cautiously stepped inside to assess the devastation further. Inside the cabin, I was greeted with an auditory assault, a grotesque, wet crunching sound that made my stomach turn. My eyes were glued to the sight of what seemed to be bones and flesh scattered across the floor. And then, as my eyes adjusted to the dimness of the room, I saw it. It stood near a shattered window, a nightmarish figure with elongated limbs and a skull-like head fitted with twisted antlers. It emanated an ungodly stench that made the hairs on my neck tingle with repulsion. Without any rational thoughts or hesitation, I bolted out of the cabin as quickly as my legs could carry me. No time to call for help or process what I had seen. Just pure adrenaline-filled instinct. I had nearly reached my ATV when the creature appeared on the path in front of me, its putrid breath curling around me like rotten fog. Transfixed by terror, I stared at it as skull-like visage and staggering antlers for what felt like an eternity. Well, what are you? I managed to sputter as I pulled myself together. It merely cocked its head in response before crawling towards me with an eerie creak of bones. As it drew nearer, I remembered that Esther was gone and wouldn't be back any time soon. In desperation, I painfully reflected on why we hadn't been equipped with firearms for this particular mission. Then, something deep within me snapped, a primal instinct taking over. With every ounce of strength left in my body, I launched myself at the creature, desperately hoping to knock it off balance and by some time. My sudden attack caught the creature off guard, sending it stumbling back. I took my chance to scramble onto my ATV and kickstart the engine. Panic filled every move as I attempted to control the ATV. The creature shrieked in rage and charged towards me, its immense strength causing the ground to tremble with each step. I sped away from the cabin, trees blurring past in a dizzying combination of terror and adrenaline. I could hear heavy breathing and crackling of branches getting nearer. As the creature closed in, I realized calling for help wasn't an option. There was no time to grab my walkie-talkie or phone without sacrificing precious seconds. Miraculously, I spotted a cliff up ahead that offered some hope of escape. With no other choice, I careened towards the edge and launched myself off the ATV moments before it plunged over the precipice. The creature skidded to a stop at the edge of the cliff, its skull-like head snapping back and forth as it searched for me. I clung to an outcrop, desperately trying to stay out of sight. My grip was slipping but calling for help might attract its attention again. After what seemed like hours, the creature retreated with a snarl of frustration. Shakily, I clambered back up, trembling not from cold or fatigue but from the horror that clutched at my heart. 
I knew I had to reach safety and report what happened to Esther before it came back or hurt anyone else. With effort, I picked up my battered body and trudged through the night towards town. Upon arriving, I immediately found Esther and explained everything that had transpired while she listened with shock etched across her face. She insisted we contact authorities who sent a team to investigate further into this unknown threat lurking in our woods. As news spread quickly throughout town about my horrifying encounter with this monstrous beast, borders were strengthened, and residents were forbidden from entering the nearby woods until authorities had investigated and assessed the danger. Days went by with no sign of the creature. Life in town slowly returned to normal, but I couldn't help but constantly look over my shoulder. Our lost colleague's face appeared in my nightmares every night, and I knew I wasn't the only one who mourned his passing. In the end, the creature was never found. Speculations ran wild about its origin and motives. However, no concrete answers emerged. The only thing that everyone seemed to agree upon was that it was, most definitely, not of our world. Despite the tragedy of losing our colleague, Esther, and I dedicated ourselves to our work as a way to honor his memory. We made it our mission to be prepared for whatever menace might arise in the future. As time wore on, memories of the encounter faded into a dark corner of our collective consciousness. But for those of us who experienced it firsthand, we would never forget its wretched gaze and ominous violence. But life carries on amidst such darkness. So we hugged our loved ones a little tighter, looked out for our community more diligently than ever before, and continued living each day fully aware that unseen terror might lie just beyond the trees, waiting. My world had changed ever since I moved to Alaska for a fresh start. The beauty of the wild was both breathtaking and thrilling, but it was not always pleasant, particularly during my regular treks through the dense forest in search of more trees, a favorite pastime to keep me motivated and connected with nature. One day, while I continued on my usual route, I came across something that shook me to my core. I walked through the forest with my trusty axe strapped to my back and whistling a tune to myself when I heard a sharp crack echo through the trees. My first instinct was that it must have been ice breaking or a tree falling, as I quickly glanced left and right, trying to measure the distance and direction of the sound. To my growing horror, I registered the shape of a human arm lying in a patch of snow ahead of me. A million thoughts raced through my head, and I contemplated calling for help, but my cell phone service was non-existent out here, typical Alaska. My heart pounded rapidly as I approached with caution and tried to joke about the situation in an attempt to alleviate the tension building within me. Hey there, buddy. I said nervously. Seems like you've lost your touch. As I got closer to the severed limb, I noticed blackish-purple marks encircling what remained of its shoulder. It looked like something powerful and monstrous had ripped it from its body, like some enormous jaws had clenched down like those of a massive bear or worse. Suddenly all humor dissipated replaced by morbid curiosity and deep trepidation. But there was no option other than continuing forward until help could be reached or the threat eliminated. As the trail wound deeper into uncharted territory, more signs of violence emerged, scraps of fabric caught on sharp branches, blood-stained leaves, an ominous skittering sound that seemed always just out of sight. As the sun dipped low in the sky, bathing the forest in twilight hues, I came upon an eerie clearing. Kneeling before a makeshift shrine was a figure, 
hunched over and seemingly in prayer. The shriek of terror that lodged in my throat at this damning sight simply refused to leave, though my legs somehow managed to plant themselves firmly on the ground. I cautiously stepped forward, hand hovering over my holstered pistol. The guttural chanting of the figure seemed to grow in intensity as it stretched long, gnarled fingers towards a blood-stained effigy at the center of the shrine. With each passing syllable, its unearthly form seemed to take on some horrific new aspect. Gathering my courage, I called out loudly, Hey! hoping for any reasonable explanation for these gruesome crimes against humanity. Immediately, the chanting ceased as the figure jerked upright and locked eyes with me. Its visage was twisted by shadows and impossible to discern clearly. But what could be seen was beyond human, a sinister creature wearing human skin like a tattered cloak and horns protruding from its head like twisted branches or roots. In that moment, it became clear that my only option was to escape this nightmarish scene. Despite my instincts screaming at me to turn and run, I somehow managed to take another step back, slowly putting distance between myself and the creature. It stared at me with unrelenting intensity, its terrible gaze piercing straight through me. There was no shred of humanity left in those eyes. The phone in my pocket felt like a burning temptation, but I knew that calling for help would lead to questions I had no answers for, not to mention potentially endangering whoever might answer my call. Moreover, something told me that the time it would take for help to arrive would be too long. The momentary distraction could give the creature an opportunity to strike. Inching back one step at a time, I reached the edge of the clearing where the forest had grown dense once more. Then, without any warning, the creature lunged towards me with surprising agility. I swallowed my terror and bolted into the woods as fast as my legs would carry me. The haunting noise of creatures pursuing echoed throughout the forest behind me. All I could think about was surviving and escaping this unimaginable nightmare. As I weaved through labyrinthine pathways and stumbled over jagged roots and rocks, panic flooded every inch of my body. My mind raced with thoughts about friends and family. A desperate plea for their forgiveness for not being there when they needed me was all I could muster. The terror propelled me forward despite my legs threatening to give out on me. I heard a sickening thud and scream from behind. I dared not look back fearing what terrifying scene may greet my eyes. When it seemed like my heart would burst from my chest, I suddenly spotted a cabin just up ahead. Bursting through its door and slamming it shut behind me, I frantically searched for something, anything, that could fend off this relentless pursuit. The only defense I could find were old, rusty nails and a wooden plank a pitiful defense against the horrors outside, but enough to delay them from reaching me. The creature slammed into the door like a battering ram while I feverishly tried to nail the plank into place. Agonizing screams echoed through the cabin while a cacophony of rage emanated from the creature and its pack. As night turned to day, the dreadful noises subsided, replaced by eerie silence. All that remained was the sound of my own labored breaths. Waiting anxiously for what felt like an eternity, I finally decided it was safe to leave my hiding spot. Hesitantly, I removed the makeshift barricade from the door and cautiously stepped outside, prepared for any signs of danger. The landscape seemed untouched by my ordeal if not for blood stains scattered around and severed limbs that lay nearby. I began to make my way back towards civilization, holding on to hope that what I had just experienced would not torment me any further. Pray as I might, 
I could never forget the victims left in the wake of this ghastly creature faceless strangers whose lives had been violently snuffed out by a monster straight out of a nightmare. Determined to survive this encounter and warn others about what lurked in those dark woods, I pressed forward on trembling legs. No horror or story about existing folklore could ever compare to the sheer terror and gruesomeness that I had witnessed firsthand, an unimaginable hell hidden away in uncharted depths of Alaska. It was around 10 a.m. on a casual June morning in 2017, and I had just fired up the grill to cook breakfast next to our rented RV. One of our group's annual camping trips typically consisted of friends cracking jokes and inhaling enough bug spray to make us cough. Hey, Josh! Did you see that squirrel try to dive headfirst into Jacob's backpack? Chuckled my friend, Karen. Seriously? It probably smelled the fruity nonsense he uses as cologne. I replied with a grin. We were camping in the serene Sycamore Grove Park in Livermore, California, where the rustling trees and quiet surroundings helped us escape from routine's humdrum. Our group had been there for two days already, merely enjoying nature and each other's company. As we sat down around the picnic table, Karen brought up something that instantly changed the atmosphere. I read online about some creepy stories about this park. Apparently, a mysterious man has been seen wandering deeper into the woods. No way, said David defensively. I don't believe it. Feeling stubbornly skeptical but amused by our group's sudden change of demeanor, we continued with our relaxing day outdoors. The topic remained unresolved but lost in favor of a game of touch football. Later that evening, as we sat huddled around the campfire exchanging more ghost stories and singing songs, I noticed movement at the edge of the firelit area. Squinting my eyes to adjust to the darkness beyond our campfire ring, my heart began pounding rapidly when I recognized it wasn't just my imagination. A tall man stood just beyond flickering shadows cast by our roaring flames. He had wild black hair streaked with red and a pale face covered in dirt and dark markings. He wore tattered clothing that looked as if they hadn't been touched by water or soap for ages his grotesque appearance was enough to send shivers down my spine. I quickly alerted the rest of our group, but as we all turned to look, the man disappeared into the darkness of the wooded area. Tensions were now running on high. It was impossible for us to shake the image of the gruesome man lurking beyond our campsite. We anxiously wondered if this was connected to Karen's story or if it was just some vagrant passing through. Attempting to relieve some tension, I cracked a joke. Maybe half red hair crept in for a midnight snack? We didn't even invite him for S. Mores, so it serves us right. Everyone gave out a nervous chuckle, but it was clear that no one was comfortable staying at that campsite anymore. After a few rushed suggestions made in hushed tones, we decided to switch locations. The move would cost us time and energy. However, we were unable to justify staying at our current site after witnessing such a disturbing figure. We hurriedly packed our belongings and moved deeper into the park where we hoped we wouldn't run into any other visitors particularly not those of the skin-crawling variety. Once we found a new spot and settled down, our group discussed the possibility that we had just encountered the same mysterious man Karen mentioned. Despite feeling on edge, there was no sign of danger around our new location. Four hours afterward, Conversations among friends and quiet rustlings of nature filled the night air like an orchestra. Gradually, 
Our confidence began to rebuild as it seemed less likely that we'd face whatever unsettling figure awaited us back at our former campsite. Unexpectedly and unfortunately, our peace shattered with an agonizing scream in the distance. Crawling into panic mode once again and certain that it must be related to the creepy man from earlier, we grasped makeshift weapons including large branches and rods from disassembled tents as we cautiously headed in the direction of the blood-curdling cry. I really hope this is just some hiker messing around, and we don't find anything horrific. Karen muttered with furrowed brows. The night grew increasingly darker as we ventured further from our campsite. Our flashlights illuminated wide, frantic eyes as we tried to understand what could have caused such a petrifying scream. Suddenly, another scream echoed through the woods, this time much closer than before. Gripping my branch tighter, I could feel my whole body trembling from an adrenaline surge as we took off towards the source, anxiety and terror clawing at my throat. As we continued towards the source of the screams, our tightly knit group moved cautiously through the dense forest. Each step became increasingly more difficult, with our legs feeling heavier from fear and fatigue. Finally, we reached a small clearing and were met with a horrifying sight, a terrified hiker covered in blood and gasping for air. The hiker seemed to have suffered an attack, but the assailant was nowhere in sight. We immediately realized that this was no prank something was terribly wrong in these woods. Stay here. I'll call for help, said Karen her voice wavering as she pulled out her phone to dial the emergency services. We all agreed that this was the best course of action, and silence followed as we waited anxiously for help to arrive. Minutes felt like hours, as we stood guard over the injured hiker and kept a watchful eye on our surroundings. Eventually, we heard rustling from the direction where we had first discovered the gruesome scene. Everyone prepared their makeshift weapons and braced for an encounter. To our horror, a tall man with half-red hair emerged from the darkness, his skin unnaturally pale and his eyes void of any emotion. Wearing torn clothing and carrying a bloodied knife, it became obvious that he was responsible for both the injured hiker and the bone-chilling scream. He walked towards us with purposeful strides, clearly unhinged but undeniably human. It became more evident that this attacker was not some supernatural being but rather a deranged individual who found pleasure in terrorizing unsuspecting campers. While our heart rates increased exponentially, we knew we had to defend ourselves against this psychopath. Everyone surround him! Don't let him escape! shouted Karen as she directed us into position. Prepared for confrontation with our makeshift weapons raised high, adrenaline coursed through our veins. The half-red-haired man kept moving forward but made no attempt to communicate or explain his actions. As he reached us, he lunged at one of our friends with his bloody knife. We all attacked in response striking the man with branches and rods in hopes of incapacitating him. In the midst of this chaotic confrontation, we noticed the distant sound of sirens growing more prominent. This was our chance to subdue the attacker long enough for help to arrive. Although exhausted and terrified, our combined efforts seemed to make a difference as the police arrived. The officers quickly took control of the situation restraining this remorseless half-red-haired man and administering first aid to the injured hiker. The night was filled with relief and sorrow as we learned that this twisted individual had inflicted harm on other campers before crossing paths with our group. Fear had gripped us all throughout that night, but finally, a sense of closure came upon us knowing that he would not terrorize anyone else again. In the aftermath of this harrowing experience, 
We stood united in grief for those who didn't manage to escape his madness. Our camping trip started as an escape from reality but ended with a stark reminder of the cruelty that exists within humanity. Driven by fear and panic, we had managed to fight back against an antagonist who wished nothing more than to inflict pain on innocent campers. With hearts heavy from the reality we had faced together, we returned home changed by the events that transpired. The haunting memories of what happened in those woods would forever be etched in our minds a brutal reminder of how life could morph into a terrifying struggle for survival within mere moments. It all began in September 2016, when I moved to a secluded house just outside the town of Marstown, West Virginia. The serene location paired with an amazing view of the mountains was exactly what I needed after a bitter divorce. My once comfortable life had been ripped from me, and all I wanted was a fresh start. My new best friend during that time was a man named Ron Demetrius who had lived in Marstown his entire life. He knew everyone and everything about the area. As a genuine fellow who cared about people, he made it his mission to make me feel welcome. We'd frequently share meals and chat together on my front porch, often losing track of time until well after sunset. One particular evening, as we sat in the fading light sipping on our drinks, Ron told me a story about an old abandoned mine nearby that had been closed for decades due to several unexplained accidents. The townsfolk whispered tales of terrible things surrounding it, strange accidents, mysterious disappearances, and odd sightings that seemed otherworldly. We've had several children go missing over the years, Ron said gravely. When it happens, everyone gets antsy and keeps their eyes peeled for any signs of those dreadful black-eyed kids. Black-eyed kids? I asked skeptically. Yeah, he replied. They're just like any other children except their eyes are completely black, no white part at all, like pits to oblivion. My curiosity peaked. I asked more about these strange fearsome beings. Well, he continued with a heavy sigh. They only appear at night near the old mine and have this supernatural aura about them. They've been luring people there for years, but no one's ever caught one or even seen one with their own eyes and lived to tell the tale. At that moment, we were interrupted by the sound of a heavy thud coming from the back of the house. Ron grabbed a flashlight, and I followed him as we investigated the source of the noise. After a quick examination, we discovered that a tree branch had fallen onto the roof, no doubt weakened by recent storms. With that mystery quickly resolved, we bid each other good night and returned to our respective homes. The conversation with Ron stuck in my mind for days. Each night, as I lay down to sleep in my new surroundings, I couldn't help but wonder about those black-eyed children. Deep down, I believed it was all just local folklore meant to keep people away from the mine. About two weeks later, after sunset on a rainy evening, I decided to take a drive and explore the area's back roads by myself. The weather was abysmal and visibility poor. It was difficult for me to see more than a few feet in front of the vehicle. After ten minutes of driving cautiously along an unfamiliar narrow trail, my headlights shone upon something up ahead. Two small figures with their backs turned to me stood huddled together in the rain. Slowly, I pulled alongside them and rolled down my window to offer assistance. They turned towards me eerily in sync, and my blood ran cold when I saw their eyes, black as coal hypnotic pools of nothingness. Could you give us a lift? The girl asked sweetly, trying to sound innocent. Our parents are waiting for us at the old mine, 
I knew in that instant they were those sinister children Ron had warned me about. Frantically rolling up my window and pressing down hard on the accelerator, I sped away from them as fast as possible. Their haunting faces were etched in my memory forever as terror gripped me tightly. I drove away from the black-eyed children as fast as my car would allow, but fear had taken hold of me. I couldn't get their haunting faces out of my mind. Their eyes, those soulless pools of blackness, seemed to envelope me, even though I was no longer in their presence. I knew I had to seek help, but who would believe me? The local sheriff might laugh at such a story and label me as just another person getting caught up in the town's mythology. Whatever these creatures were, they were genuinely dangerous. No tales or superstitions could change the fact that what I had encountered was real. It was getting late, and I needed to make a decision. Eventually, I decided to call my neighbor Ron. He had heard about these children before, and perhaps he would know what to do without involving law enforcement. Ron, I said, trembling as my voice stuttered through the phone line. You're not going to believe what happened to me tonight. What is it? Ron replied with urgency. I encountered those black-eyed children you told me about. My voice cracked with fear. I could sense Ron's shock on the other end of the line. He hesitated before speaking. You need to come over right away. Arriving at Ron's house minutes later, I desperately recounted the events of that night. Ron listened intently, his face filled with concern. We have to warn others, he declared grimly. We moved quickly to assemble a meeting at the town hall for the following day. It wasn't easy convincing people that this gathering was of utmost importance, but our persistence paid off as townsfolk filled the seats, curious to hear what we had to share. As we stood in front of the congregation and presented our story on this menacing threat lurking just beyond their doors, we knew this was our only chance to convince them that these children were a genuine danger. At first, skepticism weighed heavily in the room, but as we provided more details on the black-eyed children, some people began to listen with interest. They asked questions about how to protect themselves and their families from these twisted beings. One gentleman revealed that his son had gone missing near the old mine several years earlier, and he now believed that his child may have been taken by these creatures. A somber realization descended upon the crowd as they acknowledged that these hotspots for black-eyed children's activity were the same areas where numerous people from their community had vanished without a trace. The townsfolk agreed that something had to be done to keep themselves and their families safe. They vowed to work together and watch out for one another, increasing security measures and organizing nightly patrols to help ensure everyone's safety. We managed to help make the community more aware of the danger lurking in the shadows. The once-dismissed rumors were now taken seriously as a genuine threat that demanded action. Over time, more people came forward with tales of encounters with the black-eyed children, lending further credence to our story. Some mourned lost family members who had crossed paths with these dark beings or disappeared near the old mine. Although life in our town would never be quite the same, our inhabitants' unity in facing this unnerving menace was heartening. We managed to protect future generations from falling victim to the black-eyed children. In doing so, those dark entities ultimately failed in their sinister goal of spreading fear and chaos within our community. As time marched on, I never forgot my brush with those terrifying beings or the courageous individuals who joined us in safeguarding our home against them. Together, we survived an unimaginable horror but emerged as an even stronger and closer-knit community.
It was April 2011, and I had decided to take a much-needed break from city life and escape to the remote forested area of West Virginia. My name is Benjamin Kowalski, and I'm your average blue-collar worker who enjoys spending time outdoors. My destination was a beautiful, secluded cabin miles away from anything or anyone. I thought this would be an excellent opportunity to get some rest, relaxation, and maybe even do some hiking. My journey began early one morning as I drove my old pickup truck along a winding dirt road. The cabin I rented was completely off the grid, relying solely on solar panels for electricity and a well for water supply. As I got closer to the cabin, I started noticing unusual scratch marks on the trees surrounding the road. They were so deep that it's almost impossible not to notice them. Upon arriving at the cabin and unpacking my gear, I realized that these strange marks continued even around the cabin's perimeter. This piqued my curiosity. However, I brushed it off as some local wildlife passing through. After all, bears are common in these parts. That first night was quiet and uneventful. The pleasant chirping of crickets combined with cool mountain air ensuring a good night's sleep. It was only the next day that things started taking a strange turn. While exploring the nearby woods, I came across an abandoned campsite. The tent was shredded on one side, clothes strewn around carelessly, and judging by the amount of moss growing on top of things, the campsite seemed long abandoned. I decided to document what I saw with my smartphone's camera just in case. One never knows when authorities might be looking for clues or evidence within this national park. Little did I know that this impulsive decision would quickly lead me down a path of terror. Late that afternoon, during my hike back to the cabin in search of firewood, I caught a glimpse of movement out of the corner of my eye. On the lookout for bears, I cautiously approached the creature with my heart pounding in my chest. As I got closer, it became apparent that what I saw was no bear. Standing on two legs, yet strangely contorted, this reptilian humanoid sent a wave of dread washing over me. In one swift motion, it bounded up a nearby tree and disappeared into the canopy above before I could react, or even get a clearer look. I raced back to my cabin, struggling to make sense of this terrifying encounter. Was this creature responsible for the abandoned campsite, and those strange scratchings on the trees? The possibilities made my stomach lurch. That night, as darkness fell around me, I lay in bed listening to every creak and rustle that broke through the silence. Hours passed before I finally calmed down enough to let sleep take over again, a restless transition that left me feeling exhausted come daybreak. In a foolhardy attempt at bravado, I steered myself back to that eerie campsite the following day. Clutching tightly onto my trusty pocket knife, it felt like an inadequate defense mechanism against whatever I might encounter. Searching around for any other clues or explanations as to what happened here, I discovered something far more sinister than anything previously encountered, a makeshift grave marked by nothing more than piled rocks and an ominous smear of blood along its length. The disturbing revelation shook me to my core. Looking over to see the humanoid reptilian figure standing next to a nearby tree only amplified my fear further. It stared at me with cold eyes before slowly disappearing once again into the surrounding woods. With adrenaline pumping through my veins, knowing what had possibly happened here, I dashed back towards the cabin while keeping a watchful eye for any sign of pursuit. As I reached my sanctuary, slamming the door and latching every lock available. I knew one thing for certain. I needed to leave this remote area and seek safety. Yet, in that moment of realization, pounding on the door from outside stopped me dead in my tracks. 
The pounding on the door sent me into a panic. My mind raced with options, but all of them seemed futile against the reptilian monster that was most likely responsible for the abandoned campsite and makeshift grave. I knew I had to do something, or my fate would be the same as those unlucky souls. I grabbed my phone and quickly dialed 911 trying to keep my voice steady as I relayed my urgent need for help. The dispatcher assured me that help was on its way, but it would take time to reach my remote location. Waiting seemed like an eternity, but the pounding finally subsided. The quiet was both a relief and a source of terror. Had the creature given up? Or was it planning something even more sinister? Time moved painfully slowly, but finally, I heard the sound of an approaching vehicle. With immense relief, I answered the door to see a group of police officers standing outside, their faces displaying a mix of concern and confusion. I explained my encounter with the terrifying creature and showed them the direction of the abandoned campsite and makeshift grave. Though some looked skeptical, they agreed to investigate further while escorting me to safety with their patrol cars. As we moved away from my cabin and toward civilization, fear still clawed at me like sharp talons for myself and for those unfortunate victims left behind in that unsettling wilderness. But for now, we had reached safety. The investigation into the reptilian humanoid continued in the days following my escape. Though no official evidence could be found linking it to any known species or criminal activity, rumors swirled about shadowy government experiments gone wrong or cryptid creatures lurking deep within our world's unexplored regions. Though relieved to have survived this horrifying ordeal, I couldn't help but mourn those whose lives were tragically cut short by this monstrous abomination forever etched into my memories as grim reminders of human frailty in the face of unimaginable horror. Now living far away from that remote cabin, I tried to keep the nightmares at bay and focus on living my life, knowing that the reptilian menace is still lurking out there. Perhaps someday the truth will be revealed, but until then, the knowledge of its existence is a chilling burden I must bear. In memory of those who suffered at the hands of this monstrous entity, I've dedicated myself to researching and raising awareness about hazardous wildlife and environmental dangers. While many remain skeptical or dismissive of my story, I remain steadfast in my convictions. For those who have fallen victim to the reptilian humanoid and countless other unknown terrors of our world, it is our duty to stay vigilant and attempt to understand these elusive creatures before they come for us next. The shadows hold untold secrets and frightful entities, yet we must continue to seek knowledge, understanding, and ultimately safety. Only then can we hope to move forward into a world where fear does not dictate our lives, and these hellish denizens of darkness are relegated to the annals of myth and folklore forever banished from our reality. From the moment I started working at the secret government facility, hidden away in a forested area of Oregon, I knew our precautions were necessary. We were dealing with genetic experiments that few could comprehend let alone accept. My name is Leon Edwards, an unpopular name by any measure, but it's never bothered me much. The work I did demanded precision and an unwavering focus on the task at hand. Though my daily tasks were rewarding, human contact was minimal. Our team communicated predominantly through lab reports and internal memos. This isolation was for both our well-being and the public's safety, but created its own set of problems. Laughter and jokes were scarce commodities in this solitude. During an otherwise standard day in my laboratory, 
I caught a fleeting glimpse of frost on a windowpane. It made me realize how long it had been since I'd been outside. Noticing my longing for a breath of fresh air, my colleague Dr. Amelia Sutton suggested we take a brief walk later that evening. What time should we meet? I asked her as we crossed paths in the corridor. Let's say around eight. That'll give us enough time to wrap up here and have dinner first. She replied. Sounds like a plan, I said with a smile. We met at the edge of the forest as agreed, bundled up in coats and scarves to stave off the biting cold. For a while, we simply walked aimlessly amongst the trees, enjoying both each other's company and the silence that enveloped us like a warm blanket. Leon, Amelia said hesitantly, breaking the silence that had settled between us. Have you ever felt like we're being watched out here? Like we're not entirely alone? I considered her question for a moment, then replied with equal caution. I've never given it much thought before, but now that you mention it, sometimes there is this sensation that we're not the only ones here. Just as the words left my lips, we heard a strange sound echoing through the forest something between a screech and a guttural growl. Instinctively, we both turned in the direction of the noise. A figure stood mere yards away from us, its features obscured by darkness. Frightened, Amelia stumbled back into me. What is that thing? She whispered, clutching my arm. I knew I should have called for help, but another part of me urged caution. If whatever lurked in the shadows were a secret we brought to light, there was no telling who it would put at risk. I don't know, I admitted, equally mesmerized and repulsed by the creature before us. But I don't think we should stick around to find out. We slowly began backing away from the beast, never taking our eyes off it. Suddenly it lunged towards us. In fear and panic, we turned to run. We were sure it wouldn't be long before it reached us. Its long limbs made it swift like nothing known in nature. As we passed the small clearing on our way back to the facility, Amelia tripped over an unseen tree root and hit the ground hard. There was no time to check her injuries. I could hear the snarls of our pursuer rapidly closing in. Attempting to help her up while maintaining a grip on my weapon, a government-issued firearm. I realized that our safety relied on deterrence more than escape. The moment of truth had arrived. With one final glance at Amelia to ensure she'd found her footing again, I raised my gun and prepared to fire. The sound of my weapon firing echoed through the forest, but it seemed to have no effect on the creature. It continued to lunge toward us as if our attempt at defense only provoked it further. Panic took hold of me, knowing that calling for help would be pointless. With the facility being far away and this attacker seemingly impervious to a bullet, we needed a new course of action. Get up! We need to get out of here! I yelled at Amelia. She scrambled back to her feet, clutching her injured leg. As we continued our desperate sprint, I could see the creature more clearly in the moonlight. It appeared to be part human, part animal its skin leathery and covered with coarse fur, sporting what looked like sharpened antlers protruding from its head. Its powerful limbs propelled it easily over obstacles as it pursued us relentlessly. We ran until our legs burned the adrenaline-fueled fear keeping us from stopping or looking back. Glancing around for anything that could buy us some time, my eyes landed on an old wooden shack barely holding itself together. There! We can hide in there! I shouted, pointing at the dilapidated structure. We darted inside and locked the door behind us. It was highly unlikely this barricade would hold against the creature's strength, but it was all we had. 
trying to catch our breath and formulate a plan, though without much success. I wondered why we hadn't called for help earlier on. As if reading my thoughts, Amelia whispered hoarsely, Our cell phones don't have any reception out here. I nodded silently and started looking around for weapons or anything we could use to defend ourselves or escape. There was nothing much in sight. Rotten wood planks littered the ground amidst decaying leaves. Rusty nails jutting out dangerously were hardly useful. Before I had time to rummage more thoroughly, the creature's demented growls grew louder outside, prompting us to find our way up into the shack's attic. We tried to stay silent so as not to reveal our hiding spot, but our hearts pounded furiously against the deafening quiet. I've always been somewhat of a skeptic when it came to the supernatural and urban legends. Call it a byproduct of growing up in an age of misinformation and hoaxes, but I learned to take everything with a grain of salt. So, it was both surprising and slightly unsettling when I found myself face to face with something that defied logic. My story began a few weeks ago on what initially seemed like an average day in rural Georgia. I was running late for work and was rushing to pick up some breakfast from a small diner just outside of town. The sun hadn't started to rise, giving everything around me an eerie stillness. The diner was located on the edge of a wooded area, not exactly the most populated place, but it made for a decent shortcut on my way to work. Despite my regular visits, the treeline still managed to unnerve me with its quiet and unassuming presence. As I took my breakfast to go, the diner's owner, an older man named Walter Callahan, cracked a joke about the local weatherman always getting the forecast wrong. I rolled my eyes and gave him my thanks before darting back into my car. Driving along the poorly lit road that skirted the woods, I suddenly felt an abrupt thud against my vehicle. Startled, I slammed on the brakes, afraid that I might have hit an animal. My pulse raced as I stepped out of the car, checking to see if anything was caught underneath or in front of it. There were no signs of impact, no fur or blood stains, even stranger than that was what lay beside my vehicle. It was a bundle of partially torn clothing a shirt and jeans along with what appeared to be shredded pieces of flesh dangling off torn fabric. While alarming, there were no urgent phone calls or screams for help echoing from the nearby woods, prompting me to shrug off what might have simply been the remains of an animal attack. But as I continued my drive, unable to shake the feeling that something was terribly wrong, my suspicions were soon confirmed. In the distance, I saw a silhouette stalking along the side of the road. It was a bipedal creature with unmistakable canine features and its fur glinting under the moonlight. Startled by this horrific sight and with my skepticism shattered, I increased my driving speed, praying that whatever it was would just leave me alone. But to my utter terror, it stayed close behind me, matching my frantic pace effortlessly. As the creature drew nearer, it became increasingly apparent that this was no ordinary canine. Its twisted limbs and elongated snout looked like something out of a nightmare, and its eyes gleamed with malevolent intelligence. Panic set in as I swerved around bends and sped past traffic lights in desperate attempts to outrun this terrifying being. With every turn of the wheel, I could hear its claws scraping against the asphalt behind me, a horrifying reminder of just how relentless it was in its pursuit. As I approached an intersection with traffic congestion, it dawned on me that if I stopped now, it might cost me my life. Taking a deep breath and stealing myself for what had to be done, I clutched onto the steering wheel before flooring the accelerator. I prayed under my breath as I charged straight into oncoming traffic, 
leaving behind a trail of honking cars and swerving vehicles, letting out a heartrending scream when seeing the shock and terror etched onto other motorists' faces. I watched helplessly as they collided with one another while trying to avoid my frantic rush to escape. My instincts kicked in, telling me to do anything within my power to survive. Without a second thought, I grabbed my phone from the passenger seat and dialed 911. As the operator answered, I struggled to speak coherently as I swerved through traffic. I yelled over the blare of car horns, explaining that I was being chased by a creature, and it was killing people. The operator tried to assure me that help was on its way, but their voice faltered. They couldn't fully comprehend the incident's severity. Regardless, they asked for my location and urged me to drive towards the nearest police station. Suddenly, the creature lunged forward and slammed into my car hard enough to dislodge my phone from my grip. It skittered across the dashboard before falling into the footwell. Glancing back in terror, I watched as the beast's twisted limbs grasped onto my vehicle with terrifying ease. The realization struck that reaching the police station alive might be impossible. Instead, my next best chance at survival was removing myself from my car and seeking refuge inside another structure. Desperate, I made an abrupt turn into a nearby shopping mall's parking lot. The creature briefly lost its grip on my car due to the sudden change in direction but quickly pursued me again. Finding a relatively crowded area within the parking lot, I abandoned my vehicle and sprinted towards the mall entrance. Inside, people stared in confusion as I barged past them while gasping for breath. Someone shouted behind me that there was a monster outside, and panic quickly spread throughout the mall. Despite this chaotic scene unfolding around me, all that mattered was escaping this nightmare alive. As more people rushed out of stores seeking safety, or attempting to catch a glimpse of the creature stalking me relentlessly outside, security guards moved to secure entrances and locked down sections of the mall. Finally visible to others in broad daylight due to their monstrous appearance, the canine-like creature paused in its pursuit. People screamed in horror upon seeing it. I turned down a side corridor of the mall and stumbled onto a security officer standing guard. Pleading for help, I tried my best to explain the situation, but my words were barely comprehensible. Regardless, he understood my desperation and led me to a secure room within the mall's bowels. He locked the door behind us and used his radio to send nearby security personnel our location. I was relieved when the police arrived a short time later, but their expressions mirrored the utter confusion I felt during this experience. Despite my claims of multiple attacks and mutilated bodies outside, there was no evidence to corroborate them, only mangled bits of clothing near my damaged vehicle. I couldn't understand how everything had vanished so quickly, the creature, its victims, and any traces of blood left behind. The police officers tried to calm me down, suggesting it had all been a hallucination due to stress or fatigue. Deep in my heart, though, I knew what had happened. Although they never found conclusive evidence that day in terms of the monster stalking me so relentlessly, Suspicion hovered over me like a dark cloud. No matter how hard I tried to prove my sanity or convince others that it wasn't merely some vivid nightmare or delusion, nothing changed. But life went on around me as people soon forgot those terrifying moments shared within a busy shopping mall, some choosing to write it off as another urban myth perpetuated by those seeking attention. As time passed, people began to forget about it. Survivors went back to their lives but carried memories of that horrifying event with them. Some friends and families mourned and reminisced on those they lost without knowing what happened fully. Though relief washed over me that I survived such an ordeal, 
I couldn't forget the agony experienced by victims torn apart before my very eyes. As unsettling as it was knowing that a dangerous, flesh-hungry creature roamed our world, I gained some comfort in the fact that exposing it had likely saved countless other victims from its wrath. The crisp air of October 2013 greeted me as I climbed into my truck, ready for another day of work. I had been a truck driver for over a decade and knew the American highways like the back of my hand. My name's Ned Harrison, and this particular route took me through a remote area in the Allegheny National Forest, Pennsylvania, a route filled with endless trees on both sides of the winding roads. It was around 7.30 a.m. when my CB radio came to life, crackling with static before the voice of another driver cut through. Hey, Ned, did you hear about those strange happenings around these parts? I heard folks have been going missing. I rolled my eyes. Oh, come on, Davy. You know that kind of stuff always pops up once Halloween's around the corner. I'm serious, he insisted. Anyway, I gotta run. Catch you later. That exchange was soon forgotten as I continued driving, focusing on my job and the hum of the engine. Everything seemed normal until I reached an isolated stretch of road. A sudden loud bang erupted from under the truck, and my heart leaped in my chest as the vehicle lurched. Damn it! I muttered as the truck sputtered to a stop. With no other options, I grabbed some basic tools and climbed out to inspect what had happened. The tire had been torn apart. It was beyond repair. Guess it's time for the spare, I sighed. As I worked to replace the destroyed tire, my thoughts drifted to what Davy had said missing people along this stretch of road. It certainly wasn't going to prevent me from finishing my job but it unsettled me nonetheless. Finishing up with the tire replacement faster than expected, I got back on the road and focused on reaching my destination without any further incidents or thoughts about mysterious happenings. Night had fallen as I continued, the moon casting her light through the dense forest, making the shadows look like they were alive. I rounded a bend and spotted something odd on the side of the road a seemingly abandoned car. The doors were wide open, and suitcases lay scattered nearby. The hair on the back of my neck stood up. It didn't feel like a breakdown scenario. Alert and cautious, I exited my truck and approached the abandoned vehicle. As I got closer, I could see dark red stains streaked across the seats and dashboard. The sight of it, combined with the unnerving silence enveloping me, churned my stomach. Hello? My voice rang out in the chilly night air. No response returned but my own echo. A wave of dread washed over me, but I was compelled to investigate further. Following a faint trail leading into the woods from the car's location, I ventured deeper, holding my flashlight steady as my heart pounded in my chest. A sudden movement caught my eye. There, among the trees, stood a man with a lit cigarette between his lips. He flicked it away as soon as our eyes met. His figure was tall and lanky, too tall to be natural, and his face was obscured by shadows. One thing that stood out was his long fingers and abnormal reach of arms that seemed to just hang by his side. A distinct feeling of evil emanated from this strange man, sending shivers down my spine, a primal fear urging me to run for dear life. Instead of moving towards him or running away, I stood frozen in place. My instincts screamed at me to run, but my body refused to move. Realizing I had not brought my cell phone with me and couldn't call for help, a thousand dark scenarios played out in my mind. 
The man before me suddenly charged straight at me, and my reflexes finally kicked in. I bolted back towards the road, my heart hammering in my chest. Just as I reached my truck, the man appeared from the trees by the abandoned car. He waved one of his unnaturally long arms above his head, latching onto a protruding branch, and swung himself forward like a gruesome spider. Panic surged through me as I climbed into the driver's seat and started the engine. I floored the gas pedal, speeding down the road as he pursued me on foot. The thud of his heavy steps mixed with the sound of snapping branches as he moved through the forest with blistering speed. With no desire to confront this dangerous man or understand his motives, all I could think about was surviving this nightmare. As I reached a curve in the road that led away from him, I felt a small wave of relief wash over me momentarily. Not realizing just how far ahead of him I was and not wanting to risk slowing down to find out, I continued driving for what felt like an eternity until finally reaching my destination a local police station. Bursting through its doors, I tried to recount my experience calmly, an abandoned car covered in bloodstains that hinted at awful violence, and an unnerving man who chased after me and seemed almost supernatural. The officers listened intently but didn't seem convinced that an exceptionally tall lanky figure could be responsible for several missing persons along that stretch of road. Some officers were dispatched to investigate the scene. Meanwhile, others focused on retrieving additional information off the abandoned car's registration and contacting family members linked to it. Hours passed and finally, one officer called me over. Mr. Reed, he began, his expression changing to concern. We went to the location you described, and we need you to come with us to identify the scene and also help us clarify the details. Feeling terrified but knowing I needed to cooperate, I agreed. They escorted me back to the woods where the blood-stained car still rested, bright police lights illuminating the area. As we approached... I noticed something hanging from a tree near the car, a body. A sickening sense of dread weighed on my soul as I observed its mutilation. The other police officers examined the area in silence, while I stood there unable to move or speak. The tragic events that transpired in that very spot created a permanent scar that surfaced with every mention of this dark part of human history. The chilling terror that took place in those woods was finally put to an end when they captured the unruly man responsible for a gruesome string of murders. His abnormalities turned out to be nothing but genetic abnormalities, but his rage and deadly intent were undoubtedly violent and real. Several more cases surfaced linked to this dangerous man during his trial and for each victim left behind unanswered questions or unfulfilled hopes for closure. As his crimes were exposed further, countless others mourned their lost loved ones whose lives were brutally taken by this sinister figure lurking in the shadows. It's chilling how one person, through monstrous actions, can create a lasting ripple effect in others' lives. Late September 2005, fire lookout duty had always meant tedious days filled with observing the picturesque countryside and, at times, providing essential safety measures that prevented wildfires from claiming homes and lives. My name is Caden Bennett, and I was stationed at an observation tower near Silverthorn, Colorado a lush forest wilderness sprinkled with luxurious mountain lodges nestled in between the evergreens. Unusual shifts in nature had been noticed lately, enough to warrant amused talk among us fire lookouts, and it was something to break the monotony at least. An older lookout named Hank Heyer would occasionally make jokes about those changes, like, These squirrels are seriously overstocking this year. 
Maybe they know the end of the world is near. But something told me there might be a sliver of truth hidden beneath his humor. One Friday evening, not in particular, Hank and I were sharing drinks close to my tower when he excitedly retold a story of his run-in with an enormous grizzly bear. Acting out the scene with dramatic gestures, he recounted how he played dead, repeating tips he'd read from a survival manual to calm himself down. He chuckled and said he'd never forget the creature's intense gaze or its horrible stench before it wandered away. We all assumed that bears were responsible for most of the disturbances around our work areas, as such encounters were known to happen occasionally, but they still unnerved us nonetheless. The next week started like any other. I reported for my afternoon shift and settled into my routine. But something felt different than before, like the air held an unspoken tension that refused to dissipate. As I peered out into the woods that day, scanning for any signs of danger as part of my job, I spotted what looked like fresh claw marks on one of the tall pines down by the water's edge. I alerted my colleagues through our radio system, and within moments, another fire lookout named Jasmine Harrington replied that she too had spotted similar claw marks in her area a few days ago. Hank chimed in and cautiously said that it must have been a bear and not to worry. They weren't just large claw marks, though. The entire tree was almost hollowed out, as if by some enormous woodpecker or some other unknown beast. It was an odd sight to witness, but I pushed my discomfort aside and proceeded with my assigned duties for the day. About an hour after sundown, I heard an odd splashing sound distinct from the usual calming sounds of the stream that flowed nearby. Instinctively wielding my flashlight, I shone it in the direction of the noise, but as far as I could tell, there was nothing out of the ordinary, no elk or deer getting a drink or startled raccoons shaking their fur dry. As I began to make my way back to my tower though, a guttural scream split through the night air like a razor blade cutting through the thick silence around us. It chilled me to the bone, so much so that the ensuing radio chatter buzzed through my ears like white noise. There was something primal in my reaction. I felt compelled to find whoever had produced that horrifying howl. The woods around me felt different now. Unfamiliar silhouettes formed in the darkness and distant screeches echoed throughout the area. When I finally reached my tower after moments that seemed like lifetimes had passed, I relayed what had happened over our radio system in hurried and broken explanations. My co-workers began relaying encounters of their own, like Grace Thompson hearing frantic crashing noises and Eugene Hancock noting a powerful odor lingering around his tower. Each story contributed another rotten piece to an unsavory puzzle none of us wanted to solve, a burgeoning collection of stories from fire lookouts now on alert and straining to put the pieces together. As night continued to fall and dread began to blossom, I caught a glimpse of something that would shatter all attempts at reasoning we had tried up until that point. A colossal beast— Hulking muscles and thick, gnarled flesh stalked through the trees along the stream bank. Its twisted visage refracted the glow of my flashlight, revealing needle-sharp teeth and empty, glassy orbs where a predator's calculating eyes should be. I radioed for help, my voice trembling as I tried to explain the monstrous creature I had just witnessed. My colleagues responded with panic and disbelief unsure of how to proceed or what action to take. The radio fell silent, as if we were all collectively holding our breath. We agreed to meet up at a central location, safety in numbers being our only solace. As we gathered together, Eugene mentioned the strong odor had intensified around his tower, a rank stench that made it difficult for him to breathe. In a vain effort to devise a plan, 
We wondered if this creature was some sort of cryptid known to roam the dense forest of the region. Though none of us had previous knowledge of such folklore, we couldn't discard the possibility. As night wore on, the sounds around us grew more and more sinister. Muffled crashes and sharp snapping noises blended with blood-curdling screeches in the distance. We could sense that this beast was coming closer. Sticking together, we cautiously made our way toward Grace's tower, hoping that high ground would grant us some defense against this nightmarish creature. But our plan was rendered futile when we arrived at the base of her tower. The creature had already been there its claw marks deeply gouged into the wooden structure. The sight was unnerving, and we were filled with terror even though none voiced it out loud. Suddenly, a bone-chilling scream pierced through the darkness. It was Lydia, one of our fellow lookouts who hadn't made it to our rendezvous point. Panic took over us as we ran towards her last known location, thoughts racing through our minds faster than our feet could carry us. We found her moments later or what remained of her. The ghastly scene before us churned our stomachs and sent shivers down our spines. Lydia's mangled body lay in a pool of crimson, her limbs violently torn from their sockets. Overwhelmed by shock and sorrow, we knew our only option was to leave the forest as fast as possible. We called for emergency assistance on our radios, urging park rangers and local authorities to hurry in fear of what this diabolical creature could do. As we waited for help, we remained huddled together, petrified, desperate for any sign of rescue. The gut-wrenching screams continued periodically throughout the night as the creature hunted relentlessly. Our eyes widened when red and blue lights filled the horizon, the siren's faint wail offering a glimmer of hope through the consuming darkness. We raced toward our salvation, our hearts pounding with a mix of exhaustion and sheer terror. When we finally reached a fleet of emergency vehicles gathered at the edge of the forest, we collapsed into the arms of uniformed officers who tried to make sense of our terrified ramblings. They stared at us with disbelief and confusion before leading us away from that sinister scene. In the days that followed, news reports flooded local media stations. Search teams scoured every inch of that cursed forest. Though authorities discovered the remains of Lydia and other fire lookouts who didn't survive that nightmarish ordeal, they found no trace of the massive creature that had haunted us. The presence of such a malevolent beast forever changed us a wound that wouldn't heal affecting both our lives and careers in profound ways. We mourned those who were lost that night. Lydia, Maria, Robert all colleagues who had once shared cups of coffee with chats about our families or latest hobbies. But now, bound by terror and seared into our memories, were only gruesome images so vivid they could never be erased. In this harrowing tale etched into our collective pasts, we were left wondering if it was better to survive or succumb to a monster amidst despairing darkness. I was sipping water on another mundane shift when my partner, Jareth Royce, approached me with a puzzled look on his face. He handed me a thick and tattered folder that arrived in the mail. His broad shoulders slumped just thinking of the sleepless nights ahead. My name is Zane Donovan, by the way, a green beret, not the kind you'd expect to deal with ordinary paperwork. We were stationed in an isolated fort in Glacier National Park, Montana. This just came in today, Zane, he said. Our new mission is to investigate something particularly disturbing. As I opened the folder and scanned through it, I realized what Jareth meant. It was a collection of unsolved cases involving gruesome deaths that occurred in various parts of our jurisdiction each one more terrifying than the last. 
A group of campers had been partially devoured, one by one. Then there was a man found hanging upside down from a tree branch with his organs removed and placed around him on separate branches like grisly ornaments. We geared up and ventured into the dark woods to start our investigation, following the lead toward an abandoned cabin located deep within the park's treacherous terrain. Zane, do you think bears could have done this? Jareth whispered nervously as we trudged down a barely visible path hidden among tangled foliage. The unease lingered even though I gave him a light chuckle. You know, if they're on steroids, probably. Upon reaching the dilapidated cabin, we carefully made our way inside. Jareth stumbled over debris as we searched for clues amidst rotting furniture and decades-old knickknacks. I'm gonna check out back. I whispered before heading out to examine the surrounding area. As I stepped on prickly vegetation and felt jagged rocks digging into my boots, I noticed something odd, a series of deep claw marks in the ground. They weren't like anything I'd ever seen before. Hey Jareth, come take a look, I hushed. Before Jareth could respond, a guttural growl reverberated through the air. We both froze in place eyes darting in search of the source. Then we heard a sickening crack echo from the tree line barely ten feet away from us. A massive creature lunged out from the darkness, and as it entered the shadows of the moonlit clearing, we could finally observe its chilling features. It had thick matted fur that covered much of its sinewy form, emerald eyes that gleamed with insatiable hunger and dagger-like claws protruding from its enormous hands. The beast appeared to be a horrific combination of man and animal, a grotesque monstrosity that had no place in this world. We stumbled backward toward the cabin, adrenaline coursing through our veins. As I struggled to recall my training amid the panic, Jairus shouted, Get to higher ground! Realizing we couldn't take this thing head-on, my mind raced with horrifying images of what would become of us if we didn't put an end to it. The monster's raw power and extensive reach made it nearly impossible to keep out of harm's way. We quickly scrambled up an old tree on the edge of the clearing. Our guns? Jareth panted between breaths as we perched on separate branches just out of reach from certain death below. As we clung to the branches, heart pounding, I caught the glimpse of our guns left on the ground. We have to get them, I said frantically. This thing can jump up here if it wants, Jareth countered. We have to distract it somehow to buy us time. Our desperate discussion was cut short by another gut-wrenching growl from the creature below. Flipping open my phone with trembling fingers, I dialed 911. What's your emergency? A voice asked on the other end. There's a dangerous animal near our cabin. I exclaimed. It attacked us. Please send help. The dispatcher assured help was on its way but warned it would take time for the authorities to reach our remote location. Unable to rely on anyone else, we knew we had to act. Jareth found a thick branch on the ground and heaved it towards the opposite side of the clearing. The creature's head snapped in that direction as it growled in confusion. Here's our chance! Jareth shouted, leaping from the tree while the beast was distracted. I hesitated for a second before jumping down and darting towards our forgotten guns. The monstrous creature quickly realized we were escaping its grasp and charged at full speed in our direction. As Jareth picked up his gun, he fired at the monstrosity barreling towards us. The bullets barely grazed its hide, doing little to slow its pace. We turned and sprinted back towards the cabin, slammed the door shut behind us, and broke off a broom handle to wedge under the doorknob for added security. Do you think that'll hold? I puffed between heavy breaths. I hope so, Jareth replied grimly as we backed away from the door. Just as he spoke those words, a deafening crash came from outside. One of our camper friends burst into the cabin, face torn, bloodied, and barely recognizable. Amanda! 
I cried out as she slumped over on the floor. Stay with us. My head swiveled between Jareth and Amanda. As much as we needed to help her, we also needed to plan, quick. Come on, Jareth urged me away from our friend's unconscious form. We'll buy her time. We need a better weapon or trap. As we sidled through the cabin, I spotted a set of hunting traps hanging on one of the walls. Approved for large game, but would it hold up against this behemoth? At least it's a start. Jareth agreed. He grabbed several traps and instructed me on their use. No sooner had we set several traps outside than the creature pounced, launching itself towards our door once more. Perfect timing, I muttered to myself. The beast fell right into our first trap with a howl of pain, but that alone wasn't enough to stop it. Instead, it seemed to fuel its fury even further, as it growled viciously with each subsequent trap snapping shut around its limbs. As the creature roared in pain one final time before retreating back into the woods, I sighed in relief, though there was no certainty that it wouldn't attack again. When the authorities arrived hours later, they assessed Amanda's condition while examining our improvised defense. You managed to fend off that thing? An officer asked incredulously. What? What was that thing? I stammered as Jareth and I exchanged uneasy glances. The officer took a deep breath before beginning his explanation of the creature, a werewolf from Scandinavian folklore called an Alvenwald. There haven't been many sightings reported over the years, he explained grimly, but your account closely matches what others have seen. My mind raced at this revelation. Werewolves weren't supposed to exist. Yet, in the face of all that we had just experienced, I couldn't find any other explanation. Amidst the commotion, Amanda was whisked away to the hospital as we braced ourselves for a night without sleep, a night haunted by the memory of the monstrous creature with unrelenting bloodlust in its eyes. In the end, our lives returned to some semblance of normalcy, yet a dark shadow lingered. We had survived an encounter with something few others might have, and were left to bear the indelible mark of a chilling encounter with an Olvenwald. It was 1995, and my usual work routine took a terrifying turn. My name is Albert Dunstan and I lived off the grid in a secluded cabin near the outskirts of Haines Junction, Alaska. During my time here, I'd heard several strange stories from the locals, bear attacks, extreme weather events, and other odd occurrences. But the tales never fazed me. I was content alone in my cabin amid the quiet wilderness. One evening, as I made dinner over the fire pit outside my cabin, my neighbor Roger appeared at the edge of my property. He walked over hesitantly, a terse expression on his face. We'd exchanged pleasantries before but weren't particularly close. Albert, he said cautiously, have you seen Jamie? My son. He went out into the woods this morning and hasn't come home yet. I frowned never liking hearing about lost children in the vast Alaskan forests. I haven't, Roger. But we'll find him. Maybe he just got turned around out there. For the next few hours, we searched around our property lines together in vain for any sign of Jamie. Strangely enough, there was an eerie silence that seemed to grip the forest. Even the animals were quiet. As darkness started to descend upon us, despite our flashlight's beams cutting through it like blades through obsidian cloth moments before a deafening scream echoed through the trees, Jamie's voice. We rushed towards it without hesitation. The screams seemed to be coming from an area behind Roger's house, untouched land obscured by craggy rocks and dense vegetation. The unexpected terrain made progress difficult momentarily causing us to regret calling for help. 
There wasn't any signal reception in this part of Alaska. After what felt like an eternity of pushing through thorny bushes and tangled branches, we found Jamie slumped against a gnarled tree trunk not much higher than a man's thigh. His shirt was torn, and he had scratches all over his body, but he was alive with horrid effects. Jamie, are you okay? Roger asked frantically as we approached. It, it attacked, Jamie stammered his eyes wide in abject terror. It had roots for arms, sharper than any knife, and and dash. Jamie suddenly went silent, as if he didn't want to describe the creature anymore. I braved a glance into the impenetrable darkness, knowing we hadn't much choice but to return home quickly. As we helped Jamie back to his feet, Roger noticed something that made his blood run cold. Deep gashes were left in the bark of trees in our vicinity, signs of some unconceivable creature we couldn't imagine possible in this region. We carefully hiked back to our homes, never straying from each other's sight, unsure of what lay ahead or skulked within that darkness, treating every crunch of decaying leaves and broken branches beneath our feet like an imminent threat. Our hearts pounded wildly while Jamie muttered feverish ramblings about the nightmarish beast. Once we finally reached home, Roger fervently thanked me before ushering Jamie inside, then double-checked the door locks. It wasn't safe anymore. That night I lay awake inside my cabin re-securing every last window unable to shake Jamie's frenzied description. Roots for arms? This chilling revelation haunted me terribly like an abyssal specter refusing to rest until it devoured its prey entirely. The following day, unable to avoid the overwhelming sense of dread inhabiting every corner of my weak mind, I rushed to the local authorities and reported the horrifying incident we experienced. Roger and Jamie stood behind me, their pale, trembling bodies supporting each other, as they shared their encounter with this monstrous creature. The officer on duty nodded thoroughly, typing our statements into his computer. He mentioned that others had also reported similarly eerie incidents near the woods. I suggested getting a group together to search for whatever was responsible for these events. However, both Jamie and Roger refused to participate in any investigation or confrontation. They insisted on avoiding any further contact with that creature. The officer agreed with them, believing it would be safer for us to stay away from the woods. The next day I went to the nearest library and began searching information about our region's history and mysterious folklore. It was a desperate act, but I could not believe that we were dealing with an ordinary animal attack. As I flipped through the old books and tattered newspapers, I discovered a pattern. Unexplained disappearances near the woods were reported sporadically through history. Sitting in a concealed spot by my window the following night, I watched as eerie shadows danced outside my yard towards that cursed forest. Chilling noises emerged from the sinister darkness beyond my perception, and whispers filled my ears of unnatural voices beckoning me outside. My pulse escalated as seconds ticked away until suddenly, there it was, the despicable creature standing right by my fence, its putrid stench filling my lungs violently through the thin home walls. Its neck twisted towards me with disgusting agility, snapping knuckles like twigs. Violent eyes pierced me deeply begging challenges to discern its position in reality. Clutching my phone tightly while consciously remaining still and quiet in trembling agony, praying to remain unseen, unmarked, I dialed emergency services crouching underneath my window desperately swallowing gasps of shock. Before the operator answered, the creature skulked away into the night. Three days later, as I packed my meager belongings and prepared to leave that troubled village, a local historian knocked on my door with startling news. He told me he had heard of our encounter with the creature, and he believed that it was an infamous cryptid creature called 
Brit slang, which had roots for arms and a venomous gaze. The historian mentioned that, according to legend, the Gritslang resided near staircases in the woods, leading unsuspecting hikers into its lair. As I drove away from my cursed home for the last time in the dim glow of murky sunset, I could see deep scars left on tree barks by those roots like arms. My heart weighed heavy as realization approached me like a hurricane gust, an unsettling feeling knowing that we lived so blindly in what appeared to be an ordinary town. The memory of this ferocious creature's grotesque face and piercing eyes would eternally haunt every ounce of my sanity deep-rooted below the murkiness of human comprehension. I was in the middle of my daily workout, doing pull-ups with sweat dripping from my forehead when our commanding officer, Roger Fendrick, rushed into the gym. Red alert, boys. We've got an urgent mission, he barked. I quickly dropped to the ground and ran towards him, joined by my fellow Navy SEALs. Our assignment was to investigate a series of murders in an old mining town called All Hollow nestled deep in the Appalachian Mountains. A common pattern had been detected. Victims appeared brutally mauled by an unknown creature. It sounded like a wild animal, but nothing indigenous to the area could cause such destruction. Not gonna lie to you all, this one's giving me the creeps. Jason Herlocker admitted as we boarded our transport helicopter. I agreed but couldn't resist a smirk. Well, at least we know you won't make a good rug for that unknown beast. When we arrived in Al Hollow, its eerie silence struck us immediately. The gray sky hung heavy. Even though it wasn't raining, everything seemed damp. We walked through narrow streets bordered by weathered houses filled with fearful inhabitants who refused to leave their homes. We set up our base of operations in an abandoned warehouse on the outskirts of town where we unloaded our gear and prepared for whatever awaited us. I introduced myself as Frank Worthington to Mayor Everett Beasley who provided us with copies of the victim reports and every bit of information that could help us in solving the mystery. We studied photographs of savagely mutilated bodies with slashed throats and limbs torn apart. As horrifying as those pictures were, they revealed no clear indication of what might be responsible for these gruesome acts. Mayor Beasley's voice trembled as he told us about an old legend folks around here believed a mysterious creature roamed the mountains ever since gold miners had stumbled upon something they should have left undiscovered over a century ago. Of course, y'all understand I don't believe any of that, he added, eyes darting nervously. We're all adults and know better than that. Our first day of investigation led us to a dense forest where one of the latest murders had taken place. As we moved cautiously, the air crisp beneath the treetops, we noticed a pungent aroma filling our nostrils something similar to rotten eggs mixed with burned hair. Peter Kleifaler, our team's recon expert and a talented tracker too, pointed at the disturbed soil blood. We all agreed that whatever killed those people left behind no ordinary trail. Eventually, as the sun started setting over the horizon and shadows crept in around us, we stumbled upon an entrance to a vast system of tunnels set into a hillside. Suddenly, we heard echoing screams from deep within. Heart pounding in my chest, I glanced at my partner's own faces marked with fear and determination. Huddle up, Roger ordered. Without hesitating, we formed a tight circle as he continued, strategizing our next move. We don't know what's down there or who needs help. We need to proceed with extreme caution. Weapons drawn and senses heightened, we entered the darkness before us. I thought I heard my own pulse grow louder with each step forward wondering if this menacing beast would make its presence known in the darkness around us. 
As we ventured further into the foul-smelling tunnels, a grotesque creature suddenly emerged from behind the shadows that towered over us at least ten feet tall with razor-sharp spikes along its scaled spine. Mouths filled with teeth lined its serpentine head. Its unnervingly pale eyes pierced through the darkness like searchlights. With no time to waste, I shouted, We need to get the hell out of here. The terror in my voice was evident to all. We sprinted back the way we came, hoping to find the tunnel's entrance and escape this nightmare. As we ran, the beast's snarls and growls echoed through the tunnel. Checking behind us, we saw it relentlessly pursuing us. Its powerful legs propelled it forward at an alarming speed, and I realized that calling for help would be pointless. No one could make it here in time to save us. Peter led our escape while Emily dialed for assistance. Between her frenetic gasps for air, she informed the operator of our perilous predicament. Their reply was not comforting. They wouldn't be able to reach us in time. Despite our exhaustion, we couldn't stop running even for a second or risk being mauled by the creature. A moment when Roger Tripp served as a stark reminder of what we were up against. Chad and I swiftly yanked him back up as he let out a yelp of pain from his scraped knee. We didn't dare look back to see how close the creature was. Just when hope seemed lost, Peter yelled, There's the exit! We pushed ourselves harder than ever before as light from the entrance came into view. Bursting out into the open air, our lungs straining with exertion, we realized that there was no time to pause and gather our breath. We had to keep moving or face certain death. Dashing through the forest with adrenaline coursing through our veins, we heard branches snap as the horrifying creature emerged from the tunnel behind us. Its roar pierced through the air, but fear propelled us onward. The thick foliage obscured the monster's form as it hunted us relentlessly. Even though breathless and exhausted, we understood that stopping meant death. Just when despair started creeping in, we heard the distant wail of sirens approaching. Relief washed over us as our desperate call for help was finally answered. We raced towards the approaching rescue teams and held up our arms in hopes they would spot us. With impeccable timing, an assault team arrived at the forest's edge, expertly trained to handle such incidents. As we trudged through the last few meters, a barrage of gunfire erupted behind us. We turned to see the creature in agony, writhing on the ground as bullets riddled its body. The onslaught ceased, leaving the monster lifeless, a gruesome heap rather than the terror that had chased us relentlessly. The initial wave of relief passed as the main squad led us away from the fallen creature. Looking back at lifeless eyes that had haunted us just moments prior, our hearts heavy with sorrow. A full debriefing later revealed that our story was just another among many disturbing tales from those mountains. Authorities decided not to disclose details to avoid panic, but we knew what awaited anyone who dared venture into those tunnels. Every now and then, I find myself reminiscing about our fateful encounter with the monstrous creature and mourning those who weren't as fortunate to escape its grasp. I'd never seen a crime scene quite like this one. As a small town cop named Jeremiah Hewitt, Gruesome cases were rare in our sleepy community. My heart raced, and I took deep breaths to suppress the nausea that churned in the pit of my stomach. The victim's mangled body sprawled across the office floor, twisted into an unnatural position. Without a doubt, this wasn't an ordinary murder. You all right there, Jerry? My partner, Lucinda Parks, asked, observing the ghastly scene before us. Me? Yeah, never been better, I replied, sarcasm dripping from each word. This mess makes me want to become a vegetarian. Lucinda let out a soft chuckle and patted my back. 
It's not every day we experience something like this in Thompson Springs. Good thing we skipped breakfast today. The office belonged to Terence Quinn, a real estate agent known for closing deals faster than you could say fixed-rate mortgage. It was located on Main Street in Thompson Springs, Utah, your typical small American town with petite cafes, antique shops, and smiling locals. As Lucinda and I continued our investigation of the crime scene in meticulous detail, documenting every visible shred of evidence, my mind couldn't shake off the strange feeling that something more sinister was at play. The brutality of this murder was unlike any other I had encountered in my two decades of service. We collected statements from Terence's co-workers and discovered that he had suspended his operations for a few days due to an unwelcome visitor, a menacing person with unkempt hair who had been loitering around his office for over a week. Descriptions varied among witnesses. Some mentioned that he carried concealed weapons but none knew who he was or why he lingered near Terence's office. It seemed as if he had come out of nowhere. A week later, still scratching our heads, Lucinda and I received a panic call from the local bakery. Another murder. This time, the victim was Georgette James, the bakery's owner. Her body bore chilling similarities to the real estate agent's. Both victims had been mutilated, almost beyond recognition, by something that left claw-like marks gouging deep into their flesh. A sick realization began dawning on us we might be dealing with a serial killer. Newspapers and television stations across the state picked up on the story, nicknaming our faceless menace. The Thompson Ripper We interviewed friends, family members, employees, Nobody could provide a direct link between Terence and Georgette. Our relentless pursuit of evidence seemed fruitless, and our spirits dampened. What unfolded over the next few weeks was unlike anything I'd ever seen before, a string of brutal murders plaguing Thompson Springs with no end in sight. Lucinda and I worked tirelessly to connect the dots but came no closer to unmasking the identity of our cruel antagonist. One afternoon in mid-August, an anonymous tip led me to an abandoned warehouse on the outskirts of town. The air was heavy with rain, curtains of ominous clouds threatening to erupt at any moment. The derelict structure stood silently among fields of wild grasses like an obstinate memory refusing to fade away, a natural hiding place for something malevolent. As I entered the gloom of the warehouse with my flashlight guiding me forward, Every instinct warned me that this was not a place meant for human company. The rusting heap of old machinery and crates loomed large. Only faint echoes offered comforting reminders that there was still air to breathe between these crushing walls. Hewitt? You there? Lucinda's voice crackled through my radio. Yeah. I whispered not daring to raise my voice lest it disturb whatever demons may lurk here. I've just entered the warehouse, following that lead. I'll let you know if I find anything. Be careful, Jerry, she replied. As I made my way through the warehouse, my flashlight beams swept across something that caught my attention. Resting against one of the walls was a backpack. The contents of the bag were spread out on the floor around it. Newspaper clippings and photographs of Terence, Georgette, and other victims littered the ground. My heart raced as I decided to call Lucinda for backup. Lucinda, I found something here. Can you come as quickly as you can? I said into the radio. On my way, Jerry, Lucinda replied, her voice tense with anticipation. I continued exploring while waiting for her to arrive. My flashlight revealed a makeshift living area with dirty blankets scattered in one corner. It appeared that someone had been living amongst the grim machinery and crates. As I moved closer to inspect the bedding, the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. Someone was watching me. Before I could react, a figure lunged at me from behind a large crate. The man was muscular, covered in scars, and his daunting size made him terrifying. He tackled me to the ground, pinning me beneath his monstrous weight. 
panic surged through my body as he clawed viciously at my chest. I couldn't break free or even scream for help because his crushing grip made it impossible to breathe. Suddenly, Lucinda burst through the warehouse doors wielding her gun. She fired a shot in our direction just in time. Her bullet grazed the side of the attacker's head, causing him to loosen his grip on me momentarily. Capitalizing on this opportunity, I shoved him off and scrambled away from him as far as I could manage. The deranged man rose to resume his attack but was met by another shot from Lucinda's gun that hit him directly in the chest. He stumbled backward until collapsing against one of the crates where he remained motionless. Exhausted and gasping for breath, I thanked Lucinda for her timely intervention. Paramedics and backup arrived soon after, providing medical attention to my injuries and securing the crime scene. During the ensuing chaos, we identified the man as David Reed, a former employee of Terence and Georgette. A closer investigation of his belongings at the warehouse revealed that he suffered from paranoid schizophrenia and had developed a deadly obsession with his former employers after being fired months prior. In the days following David's capture, we ascertained that he had been stalking his victims before unleashing his fury on them, leaving those ghastly claw marks across their bodies. David Reed became known as the Thompson Ripper, responsible for terrorizing Thompson Springs with his brutal vendetta. We then held a memorial service in honor of the lives lost to David's ruthless carnage. Terence, Georgette, and other victims were commemorated by their loved ones and members of the community who vowed never to forget their tragic fates. With David behind bars, Thompson Springs could finally begin its journey toward healing. As for Lucinda and me, we continued seeking justice for the people of our town while remaining vigilant against potential threats. The scars left by the Thompson Ripper reminded us that danger can lurk in the most unexpected places, and that our duty is to protect others from such horrifying realities. <laughs>